meeting for Tuesday, April 9th, year 2002. And uh, the first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States. We have got um, a tremendous amount of business this evening, and so I'm going to uh, try to try to move us through this as quickly as possible. Um, adjustments to the agenda. Kevin. I have one. Uh, we need an executive session following this meeting to discuss negotiations with secretaries and head tech ones. Okay. It is on there. It's on there. Oh, it is? Yeah. Yep. It's on the back. We ran out of space. It's over on the back. Other adjustments to the agenda? So we're all set on that. Um, seeing none, I'm going to move on. Approval of the February school board minutes. Should be March. <laughs> Could have fooled me. <laughs> I fool just you. noticed it. I'm I thought it was still. Mar I thought it was still March. No. Um, of the March school board minutes. Um, any uh, comments? Revisions? Uh, seeing none, we're going to move on and uh, invite our high school representatives to speak to us. <laughs> All right, uh, first thing we're going to talk about uh, are the SDP projects that the seniors are going to be involved with in the upcoming month of May. Um, right now, our senior stand is uh, seniors have made contacts with the business or projects that will be with for three weeks before graduation. Um, and the upcoming, I think next week, next week proposals are due. Um, you have to have a sheet that says where you're going to be for all three weeks. Um, most seniors are well on the way of uh, getting everything cleared through the, uh, the, uh, rep, or the, the, like the counselors or yeah, the school, uh, SDP team. The, yeah, the team for SDPs. Um, and right now we have 16 school days till um, SCP start. I, I think that's the last count. Yep. Um, and the next big thing on, for seniors right now is college acceptance. So a lot of seniors are hearing back right now. Yeah. Uh, we also, uh, this is actually last month that we first heard about that. Uh, this, uh, it was actually the day of the last meeting. Um, but uh, the later start for school days has been proposed. Uh, uh, Dr. Frisella came in and spoke with us about that. Uh, and we gave it a month to kind of, you know, gauge the reaction of students to see what they thought of it. Uh, and actually at the last meeting we had, <clears throat> we kind of took, you know, a straw polls, what we thought, um, we thought uh, about the idea. Um, and the majority, um, and a substantial one I thought, um, liked the idea, uh, but expressed concern regarding um, after school activities, sports, stuff like that. Um, so obviously I, th I think there's, you know, somewhat of a consensus for it and it's, and it's workable, um, it's the main idea. and. Uh, it, uh, you know, as long as we're willing to compromise and work out something. Um, so, and I think everybody's uh, very looking forward to uh, waking up 45 minutes later last year. So, next, next year. Um, yeah, the only problem they had was uh, if we start 45 minutes later, are we going to get out 45 minutes later? And we talked to Dr. Frisella about it. I'm sorry, Mr. Frisella, getting you guys mixed up. Um, and, yeah, we talked about it, and that's basically where we stand, since most people don't want to have everything pushed back to the like, wee hours of the night. Um, then another thing, uh, we have April vacation coming up, and we just got through the, uh, the third quarter, so that means school is done for seniors. <laughs> it, it, it means what? What did you say, David? It means what? School is done for seniors now. Oh. So, yeah, now we just coast on through and hope our chief will pull up. Okay. D is for Come D is for diploma. Right. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but uh, also, uh, I believe we spoke about this last month, but uh, the dentist has responded, uh, and we've started uh, making posters for the public awareness thing regarding uh, soda consumption and its various uh, dangers. Um, uh, a big event on May 2nd um, are the Special Olympics, the Special Olympics track and field meet. Um, this year, I've started early posting um, uh, signs and flyers around the school. Uh, as of right now, we have about 200 volunteers in the high school alone. Um, usually the middle school band comes down and participates um, in the marching ceremony and the parade in the beginning. Uh, we'll be having a torch run this year. Um, 
since there's so many uh, volunteers or people that want to volunteer, um, the administration and the uh, coordinators are going to have to come out, come up with a uh, academic eligibility system because we, you know, 200 volunteers for uh, 450 athletes is a, uh, it's a whole lot of volunteers. So and those are just the volunteers from Cape High School. So that's um, that's going to be an all-day event on May 2nd, and the rain date is May 3rd. Also, uh, the prom is coming up uh, April 26th. Uh, everybody's looking forward to that. Uh, also, uh, we got the news of uh, the fundraising necessity you presented us with uh, regarding you know, charging for after-school activities. Um, and <clears throat> the SAC discussed it at length uh, at our last meeting. And basically, what we decided on at the end was is we definitely understand why you guys did it. Um, we're kind of disappointed that it had to happen, but uh, we, we understand you know you guys are facing a budget crunch and stuff like that. So. Um, uh, that's basically our, our line on it. They, they asked us to present that to you tonight, our, our take on it. Yeah, we don't really want to get involved because yeah. I went to the uh, forum last night, yeah. <laughs> can, Chris, could you, I'm sorry, um, could you just repeat again what you had said? I, um, I don't have my contacts in, so I have to put my glasses on or off, and I'm, I'm, I think it's affecting my hearing tonight, so. Um, <laughs> What, what is it that, what is affected by the budget, did you? Uh, well, we talked about how uh, they're going to start charging for uh, extracurricular activities next year. Uh, it was, it was a, there was a public workshop on that to, to take public input on that concept. There's mm. been no decisions so, at so all made. it's not made. definite? It's definitely not definite. Okay, because I, I was out of town yesterday, I wanted to attend a meeting, but they, they actually told us... Uh, they that, that it was happening and stuff. And, like and it was set in stone. They presented it to us at the meeting like it was kind of set in stone. But and the response from your, um, f from the other student reps were, was what? It was, uh, they were, di I mean, they were disappointed because I think, you know, they understand the necessity, uh, the, really, in, like college applications and stuff, the necessity of after school activities. But, um, you know, we understand why you did it. So, um, I guess no hard feelings is what they <laughs> well, um, there's no hard feelings because we haven't done anything. Yeah. Well, right. And but, so, so. Even if you do implement it. But if we do, we'll know that, that there won't be hard feelings. Right. <laughs> That's good. Okay. And the very last thing on the, uh, that we have to say is that uh, last week at the end of the third quarter, the uh, seniors attempted a uh, senior skip day, and, um, yeah. and they failed miserably <laughs> because it was the end of the third quarter, and, you know, if you don't get work in by that Friday, then zero. So a lot of the seniors... Like me, Chris stayed and uh, stayed in school and <laughs> got our work done and went through the uh, pop tests and pop quizzes that randomly appeared that Friday. So. Nice. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm sure there's some questions here, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe we won't uh, get through the agenda quite as fast as I thought. Are there questions or comments? So you couldn't go into your coast early. Is that what you're saying? You couldn't go into your coast early. You said no, you were going to post. No, I didn't get through Friday last week. <laughs> okay. Other questions or comments? Just, just, a, just a, something that hit me was um, academic eligibility to participate as a volunteer in special, in special Olympics just seems like there might be some other criteria that we would maybe use also and consider yeah. um, in terms of maybe um, students who have been involved in that and for whom that's a, an important activity. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're looking at uh, certain uh, athletic teams, like the track team. Or, uh, they always participate heavily um, in other, uh, like the volunteer club and things like that. So we're going to be academics was just one uh, area that we were going to look at. <clears throat> they also depend in part on whether or not students were attendance during the last day of the third quarter. <laughs> right. Oh. See, now that would be a good criteria, perhaps. Um, okay. Thank you very much. You, you uh, did a good job. Thank you. We're going to hear from our middle school representatives. Hello. I'm here alone tonight because Lily wasn't able to attend, so. Um, <laughs> First of all, I just want to talk about the Triple uh, C Leadership Conference uh, that's going to be on April 30th. Uh, the members of student council will be participating in it and the students will be sharing experiences in implementing action plans in our school on teasing, bullying, and rumors. And it's a follow-up program to the conference that they went to earlier in the year. And also the middle school students are in the middle of a magazine drive to raise funds for outdoor experience programs and the eighth grade is raising money to take to the high school with them. And also talking about the high school, uh, we just, the eighth graders just turned in our high school 
application sheets for classes and we're waiting to see what our courses are. Uh, on April 26th, there will be a middle school dance for 7th and 8th graders and the students will be charged by vote of student council an extra dollar uh, to raise money for the Cape Play organization to build uh, the new middle school playground. Also, there's going to be a 5th and 6th grade social on May 3rd and will, they will, the 5th and 6th graders will also be charged an extra dollar for the Cape Play organization. Also, Peter Pan performances just came to an end, and it was a huge success. All the shows were sold out, and it was a really fun experience for those in the play and those in the audience as well. Uh, lacrosse and softball and baseball just started, and track is soon to follow. And hopefully we'll have successful seasons in those sports. Um, and that's just about it. That's a very good job. Questions or comments? Just a comment about Peter Pan. I saw it Saturday night, and I thought it was fabulous. And the way the kids were flying through the air. I mean, the, the kids that were behind the stage controlling that really did a fabulous job. And you made a great pie. Hi. <laughs> All right. Other comments or questions? Very good job, Solo. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks. Um, do the seniors forget about the, uh, talking about the, the prom? Was that something that, uh, They said it. Uh, oh, you did? Okay, I, I must have missed hearing. That was part of my, what I missed. They're still them. back at Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The fact of the matter is, I, if I look up in these, I can't see anything. So, If I look down here, I can't see anything without them. So. Um, we're going to move on to uh, communications. Um, you have in your packet a list of, uh, and hopefully a corrected list, of probationary teachers. Uh, at this point, this is just for your information. Um, next month, this list will come back um, for you to um, take action on. Um, any comments that, uh, that you can share with me, uh, concerns between now and next month would be appreciated. Okay. Um, comments from the public? Seeing none, I'm going to move on. Um, recognition? Nothing this month. Um, superintendent's report, update on future direction plan. Um, just a word that the future direction planning team originally, our plan was to, to meet a bit earlier, in, in probably early May, um, but because of um, the length of time it's, it's taken in dealing with the budget, um, many of those projects might hinge on that, so I wanted to be quite clear as where we sit with the, with the budget before we had our annual meeting, but that will be taking place probably in early, in early June after that budget is approved. Um, update on the Education Foundation. Um, the Foundation will, the Board of Directors will be having a retreat on April 28th uh, for the purposes of taking a look at uh, their roles, functions, how they organize with their subgroups. Um, there's been a lot of growth in the number of people that have been involved and they felt it would be a good idea for them to get together as a board um, and do some, they brought in a consultant to work with them and to bring them together as a group and establish what their roles are as a, as a board of directors. And lastly, you have some notification of teacher retirements. Uh, Nancy Rollis, um, and from Pond Cove, after 20 years of service, and Norm Richardson, who I believe is seven, seven years of service. Um, and again, all these retirements that we've been hearing about in the last a uh, few meetings, um, those people will be recognized at our last meeting in June. Great. We're going to move on to uh, principal's reports at this time, and we'll start with uh, Tom at Pond Cove. Good evening again. Um, I'd like to begin this with an update on progress with Kelly Hassan's uh, Teacher of the Year nomination in Maine. She has been selected as a regional finalist, one of ten and a visiting team will be coming on May 1st to interview colleagues, administrators, parents, community members, and I think some school board members. Um, they'd also like to have two or three of Kelly's first graders give them a tour of the school because they hinted to me that they learned a lot during those private conversations. <laughs> I've mentioned before, it's sometimes difficult for the school to focus attention uh, just on one teacher, but Kelly and her colleagues understand that in this case it represents all the great work that's going on around Pond Cove and the tremendous support from the community. So it's been a good process so far. 
Uh, springtime reminds me sometimes, I hate to wear it's poetical, how uh, encouraging it can be when things take root and grow. I've been looking back at the progress that the Pond Cove Climate Committee has made over the past few years, and now it's making connections to the uh, district-wide initiatives. Last month, we went over the results of the district-wide survey on climate, and uh, people were very tolerant of my PowerPoint presentation. I think they were grateful I didn't use many visual or um, audio effects. But we had a, a great discussion about the form and the con uh, content and the purpose of that survey and the importance of letting people share their perceptions and all that information will be relayed to the district committee. So I'm very pleased about that. Another part of the climate committee district-wide is that uh, Paula Harris and other people in the schools have been sponsoring a simulated mountain climbing event. People get credit for, have been getting credit for regular exercise during the week and they're keeping a log and you turn in the log to Paula and your little guy gets to go up the mountain with uh, incentives like prizes and sometimes a little rock slide to send you back. Little things like that I think make a difference around the school. I want to thank Paula. I think Paula and other people thought of it and Sherry Gower got the mountain up there. It's, uh, it's, it's been very pleasant. We're concluding our second round of parent-teacher conferences. I know I've said this every year since I've been here. I'm just amazed at the level of preparation that the teachers are engaged in every year and the commitment from the parents when they come in, not just to listen, but to share their insights ab about their children. Looking forward a little bit, um, when we come back from vacation, it's time for the TV turnoff week. And Valente, for the past few years, has been the contact person at Pond Cove to get the word out to teachers, and I usually send something home to parents about it. And we'd like to increase participation this year um, so that people are thinking of alternatives to, to TV. You don't have to give up on the Red Sox, but, but you, you're supposed to limit your time a little bit when you do that. And in May, the principal for the year will be here to give this report. So um, I'd suggest you save all your tough questions for him, and I will. It is a boy, and uh, that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you, Tom. Questions or comments? Thanks. Did you have your glasses on or off, George? I, was... I, ha I have them off now. <laughs> Um, high school. Jeff. Just a, a very few things. Um, David and Chris mentioned that, and, and uh, the eighth grade representative mentioned that we're in the process of course signups, and it's been fascinating for me the last couple of weeks handling what are called appeals um, from recommendations um, um, that teachers are making of students who either want to take more on a particular subject or to challenge themselves to go up to the next level. And it's a fun change in the day to deal with some students who really want to extend themselves. It's been a very, um, I've never been through that process before. It's different here from other places. And it's been a fascinating and really positive experience from my end. Um, just a few congratulations. First of all, to the girls' swim team and the jazz band who were recently recognized by the state legislature. Um, they got a trip up there and were recognized. Um, and got some applause for the tremendous accomplishments of those programs this year. Um, our drama program last night was recognized by the town council for a legacy of, uh, of, of, of excellence um, in the theater program at Cape Elizabeth High School, and particularly, uh, though not only for the excellence of the program last year, Alice in Wonderland. Um, some of you were at the science exhibition that took place a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to pretend to remember when it was, but it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the students did, I thought, I was a judge uh, for some of the projects and was very impressed, particularly by the ability of the students to articulate what was on the board um, and what it was that they learned. That's always a sort of a telling moment um, because there could, can sometimes be a gap between what the students have written or, or, and, and what they were actually able to articulate. And that was the part of it that was most impressive to me. Everybody, um, every student I talked to um, was very, was clearly in command of what they were talking about, so they got a lot out of it. Um, and I want to mention in particular um, congratulations to the three teachers who really worked very hard to put that together, and they are Doug Worthley, Bill Brewington, and most of all, um, and I don't think that Doug and Bill would disagree with me or, or be unhappy with me for mentioning her in particular for outstanding efforts, Beth Lewis. Um, she put in a, a tremendous amount of time and effort to organize that. Um, Last month, I mentioned that there were two of our students um, who were finalists on the national physics exam, which is a tremendous accomplishment. Um, I'm not sure there's another school in the country 
of this size which is a public school as opposed to either an exam school a private school or a particular science and technology magnet school that has two students who did as well as stephanie reed and dan geyer did from our senior class so they what they did was absolutely outstanding um congratulations to amanda gann um, who this past weekend went to bangor um, at the annual was the nominee my nominee for the main principals award which is a annual nomination a principal makes and principals and students from all across the state come together in bangor to recognize and honor one student from each school who exemplifies both excellence in scholarship and citizenship as well and amanda certainly does that um, seniors as chris and dave sort of to some extent exemplify and i don't think they'd be unhappy with me for saying this seniors are itching to get out um, to get on to college. Juniors are itching to be seniors, and so it always makes it a very uh, interesting time in a high school, um, and all of us are itching for next week to come. <laughs> Any questions? Questions for Jeff? Have the seniors shared with the juniors now the key learnings about senior skip day? So that, I mean, has the wisdom been passed down? I think, Do we I, think? I think the rumor mill is taking care of that pretty, pretty effectively. <laughs> Other questions? Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And middle school, Nancy. Good evening. Brianna did a very good job talking about most of our things, so hopefully I can go through this. Um, the play was wonderful for lots of reasons. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned, um, and in fact, a parent volunteer who worked with our behind the stage crew and guarding Indians and pirates and lost boys, pointed this out too. One of the wonderful things about the play is to see the leadership quality of our eighth grade students. Um, eighth grade students really took charge of different groups and had different cheers and organizational things while they're waiting and keeping them organized. And the parents found them to be most helpful um, during that. So lots of times the things you don't see um, are also very important that a play like this with 150 students involved um, had a chance to do. Our experiment with the three fathers um, is continuing to be a great experiment and has worked very well. Um, their schedules, we had to adjust a few things because they do have other jobs and things that they needed to meet, but um, they have all been very dedicated and um, to meet their obligations and have readjusted and switched spots with different people. So that um, is an excellent um, idea that we'll move forward with again next year and see what happens. Um, as has been mentioned, as we get forward to spring, we have our eighth graders are excited. They're pretty excited now about being ninth graders, so um, we're trying to still keep them in line with that. But um, also our current seventh and sixth graders have turned in their course sheets, a much uh, toned down version of picking courses from the high school, but certainly gives them a sign that things are coming. We're looking forward to um, high school students coming and working with the eighth graders and also with some of our seventh graders after vacation going over and working with fourth graders to help them with the transition to middle school. Our sixth graders are excited because Chwonky's coming up. They will be going in two groups um, and through all of their efforts with fundraising and work with their parents, um, it costs $200 per student to go and yet each family contribution will be only $45. So uh, we feel very successful with that effort. On May 1st, our fifth and sixth grade bands and choruses will be singing and presenting, and I um, certainly would love to have you join us. It will be at the high school gym at 7.30. We will, the seventh and eighth grade concert is after our next board meeting, so we can highlight that at that time. We also have welcomed um, two people to our staff for the remainder of the year, as we have two teachers who will, at the end of this year, leave on maternity leave. But Michelle Garcia has joined us to finish out the year for Allison Caruso. And Megan Crabtree has joined us to complete the year for Claire Ramsbotham. Um, both pairs of teachers are working together this week to make the transition to those classes. And when the students return from April vacation, Ms. Garcia and Ms. Crabtree will be there to work with them. Um, so we look forward to working with them. And they seem to have enjoyed their first few days. At least they're planning to come back for third, so that's a very good sign. <laughs> Recently, myself and six other colleagues went to the New England League of Middle Schools. In fact, we missed the last board workshop because of that. Um, we had an opportunity to meet and talk with lots of other middle school teachers across the Northeast um, and also from some other parts of the country because the New England League of Middle Schools is the um, biggest regional um, organization in middle schools. 
and we went to things on organizational structures, homework, help after school, reading strategies, um, learning beyond the classroom, working with Sturbridge Village, math activities, science integration activities, language arts, um, individual learning styles. And to quote one of my colleagues on the way home, his comment <coughs> in the car was, you know what I learned that was really important at this conference um, is that I learned that the Cape Elizabeth Middle School is not a bad place to work and we're actually doing some pretty neat things. So um, sometimes it's good to go to those just to figure out maybe we're not way behind in something that we're trying to do. Yesterday um, was a special day for us. We did the play um, in-house and then also um, in our partnership with Verizon. Um, they brought the Luge team, members of the Luge team um, that they sponsor, the Olympic Luge team. And with Dick Mullen's assistance and help, we were able to go to the high school auditorium, all the students in grades 6, 7, and 8, and listen to two members of the Luge team who are called Sledders. Um, one of our students wondered if you called them Lugies, but um, they actually refer to themselves as Sledders, so we now know that. And um, talked to us about, it was a motivational kind of thing, setting goals, changing your goals, reaching your goals, adjusting them, all of those things, and then also went into some particulars of the luge. Uh, for a number of our students, the most exciting thing is that Clay Ives was there, and they got to go up and touch and look at a bronze medal. He wouldn't let any of them wear it, but he let them touch it and look at it, and that was pretty exciting for them. So um, that was a great day as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. Um, questions or comments? Um, I wanted to know if you looked into my fundraising idea at all. Um, yes, uh, Jennifer had a fundraising idea um, when she came out of the play. I, of course, thought immediately, having had the pleasure of working with Jennifer for several years, mm -hmm. that she was going to suggest seat cushions for our benches. However, Jennifer thought that might be okay, but a little mundane, because she thought the idea was we could fundraise if we gave flying opportunities um, to people, um, as Peter Pan flew, and Wendy and Michael and John. And then we thought maybe if the school board would fly first, we could take bids on how um, much they would like to fly and how long they would fly and the dances they would do in the air. So, but that's one brought to you by one of yeah, your very own Jennifer um, and certainly not one I would ever propose to. These meetings just keep getting more and more fun each yeah. month. It would have been. A good Kids would pay a buck a minute to fly in it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd pay. Family fun day. Would Family fun day. There you go. <laughs> Maybe a little consultation with the um, the, the attorney, the school's attorney first. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nancy. We're going to move on now to uh, committee reports, and we're going to start with the finance subcommittee. Kevin. Finance subcommittee met tonight, all of us. Um, and essentially, other than our typical housekeeping uh, of signing warrants, um, we discussed the budget and two proposals that would potentially decrease the budget. One of those proposals was the implementation of a participation fee for athletics and some co-curricular activities. And the other was an idea that came out of the, um, the high school that would reduce the number of uh, new teachers, increase space, and um, do a few other things that would have a net reduction of roughly $50,000. Um, there was a public hearing last night, and I think, uh, Jim, would, uh, would you mind giving a quick report on that? Not at all. Uh, last evening at 6.30 in the middle school cafetorium, there was, in fact, a forum to discuss participation fees. Uh, it was attended by approximately 50 people. Uh, as you might expect, most were in opposition to uh, the uh, concept of participation fees. There was some uh, fairly good and open discussion, though. I think uh, the forum served a purpose of making people aware of the gravity of our budget situation this year. Um, and many of the uh, concerns about participation fees that we had talked about in our board were aired again publicly, and it was good to hear uh, different people's perspectives on the topic. Um, we spent about two and a half hours doing that. Uh, I felt it was a productive evening, uh, if not from a, a uh, instruction to us, certainly from an educational perspective uh, to the general public. Thank you, Jim. 
i'd also like to take an opportunity to thank the members of the sac and student body who attended the meeting last night for their views unfortunately we don't get them quite often enough when we're making these types of decisions so that was good um the final was uh, the second proposal was uh jeff sheds uh we have not finished discussing that yet so the last item on the agenda consideration of the 2002 and three school budget will continue the discussion on both of these items and we will make an effort uh, to adopt the budget since our timeline is getting very tight i know the council would love to have a budget from us by the end of this week and the reality is that we must present the budget on april 29th um, so the only other opportunity we will have to adopt the budget would be on april 23rd at a workshop session which is probably not, not ideal but certainly acceptable so we're going to try and push through on that okay kevin thank you um policy subcommittee jen um uh, we met last wednesday at noon and we reviewed um <coughs> the policies that are in here for a second reading and um we also have one that's in here for first reading which is a special ed um policy and we also reviewed and i don't know did that have a title jeff the, the alternative instruction policy proposal we just looked at that you don't have any of that information now okay that's it yep. thanks um and uh the building committee marie um at our last meeting uh we looked at uh new lay new layouts for the um, high school building and initial layouts for um the addition at pine cove and a lot of discussion at that meeting was centered around kindergarten and um, the need, or not the need, um, for full day kindergarten. And in order to proceed with the layout plans um, for that addition, this building committee really needs a decision on whether or not um, we will have full day kindergarten in Cape Elizabeth. I, I mean, not next year, not the year after, but in the future i mean is that something um that we will do and and actually my request would be um for the school board to put together um a group to make that decision um tom and i you know don't feel that it's the building committee's decision obviously um and that would just take them in a different direction but we really need um a decision to proceed with the space um, and I think we need to do that over the next couple of months um, and, and the balance of the meeting was just talking about the uh, information that the um, subcommittees brought back to the group um, the next meeting will be on April 25th at uh, 7 o'clock so actually I'm, I'm asking for that you know to somehow put together a group and i guess that would be um i think <laughs> is that Marie you here? <laughs> um it seems to me that uh, there was a group mm -hmm. and that there was recommendations that came out of that group so i i, I mean i i'd have to maybe um uh, refer to somebody or defer to someone who's got a better memory than me or or ask Mary to take a look at you know what, what the uh, notes reflect but there was a group indeed in town that um, that studied it was shorter than it was shorter than that I think um, Elaine and I were both on that committee was, the on facilities that. committee started two years ago and that kindergarten committee ended before the facilities committee started um, that committee really never came to a final conclusion and from the information 
that was out there, um, all of the information supported full day kindergarten. Um, a lot of people did a lot of work, you know, whether it was on the internet, visiting other schools, right. et cetera, et cetera. And all of that information came back supporting it. We had taken it to, we had taken a survey and there was um, a meeting, at a parents association meeting where um, people were very split, you know, 50-50 as to um, whether or not we should do it. Um, from everything that we have heard, every community that decides to go with a full day kindergarten, if you bring it to the parents in the community, you will always have a 50-50 split. Um, the decision usually is made when there is a building project because most schools don't have the room right. to take a full day kindergarten. If there is a building project in the wings somewhere, that's when they determine and make that decision and usually they go with full day kindergarten. So, you know, we really are nowhere um, with a decision from several years ago other than that information that I just gave you. Is there anything else, Elaine? I, I, I agree with you. I, I recall correctly that the final meeting was didn't have a lot of information to, to to initiate action on because of the space limitations. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, my recollection, George, is that we asked, uh, as a board, we asked a number of questions, and the group was supposed to go out and come back with some additional information. And somewhere along the line, after that last meeting, nothing nothing happened again. Is, isn't that my? No, we had reports. Where there were visits to other schools. Oh no no yeah, done. all of that all of that stuff was done. Mm -hmm. I, I remember the presentation clearly. Yeah. Um, all of the information that the committee brought back, but I wasn't there at the end of that presentation. Additional questions. So my, here's my sense, and, and you know, yet a different perspective, but very much related. I do re recall all the work that we did. Um, and I think that there was some, there were some recommendations essentially brought back to us that it was in some ways, just as you said, it was a, a, essentially a report that was presented to the board. My sense was at that time that there was some acknowledgement, and again, we'd have to refer back to the notes, but there was some acknowledgement that we would likely have full-time kindergarten. However, at that time, given the space issues, given the, the, those particular constraints, that it was not something that we would entertain at that time. But, but I, I guess what I'm saying is maybe our work is not so far behind us that it's, it's not able to, that we're not able to kind of resurrect some of that. Um, it, it seemed as though all indications were, as you said, Marie, that uh, good, excellent school districts would, would be having full day kindergarten. And, and our limitation at that time, as I understood it, um, or as I saw it, um, was, was that in fact we didn't have the space. And so the space issue just kind of dashed it. And that's probably why Kevin has a sense that it kind of went away and never came back. But I think that in general, the, the response from, from the school board was an acknowledgement that we would have it someday. Okay, you know, and, and you're right, George. And, and what happened then when we started the facilities committee, the, after we went through the, that whole process of a year with SMRT, we had made a statement at the end of that saying that, you know, the facilities committee recognized, you know, full day kindergarten, but there was no decision made at that time. Um, and so now, you know, we're in the process of looking at plans um, for this addition, and, and we need to justify um, looking at the space that we're looking at. Um, if we will have a full day kindergarten, then the space that we're allotting could not be enough, enough room, you know, to give us a few um, teachers conference rooms or multi-purpose rooms. I mean, we would be using the, the plan that exists right now, we would be using every single room just to house you know, full day kindergarten. So I think in our plans, we don't want to be short-sighted in terms of if we're putting this addition on to Pond Cove, we want to be able to do it so that we have a building there that's good for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So your suggestion is that, that we sort of re reconvene or maybe those people are not available. It sounds like Elaine was a part of it and maybe you were a part of it. Um, that we get a group to maybe, again, not reinvent the wheel, but go back and look at what we learned 
and maybe uh, if there were some outstanding questions to, to kind of address those and come back to the board so the board can make a decision. Is that, I mean, yes. is that your proposal? Yes. And, and actually, we could probably pull some of the original members from that committee, I, I would imagine, because some of them are on our building committee right now. Um, if you wanted to do that, if you wanted those members to make a presentation to the board, per se, with the information that they have. I'm, I'm looking over at Elaine and, and thinking maybe that would be something that she would maybe take on some leadership for. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Always, always good to try. Anyway. <laughs> the person who stares at you the longest, at least I think you're staring at me. So, um, is that, well, that's back on. <laughs> If, uh, because I know you've got a, you've, I think you have enough to your do. Your eyesight's that. affecting your mouth now, George. What's that? Your eyesight's affecting your mouth now. <laughs> um, so uh, is that something that you would like to do, Elaine? I'd be glad to. Okay, good. Um, so perhaps we could just uh, recognize that we want to pull together some of those folks. Maybe other, we have maybe some other new staff or whoever who might have some new expertise and uh, re certainly dust off what we've done, because there's been a lot of work done. And, uh, and it shouldn't take all that long to come back and, and, uh, and tell us what we, you know, much of what we already know and remind us of what we know and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, get the board to make a decision. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to um, unfinished business and we have policies for a second reading. Um, if you remember on our athletic related policies, um, we agreed that these probably because of uh, the number of new policies that have been um, proposed that they would come back for a third time. So this is the second time. What we thought it might be a good idea to give you, um, last time we went through one by one, um, John Casey has a, a, sh a short PowerPoint that gives you more of a full perspective of how these policies all tie together um, rather than dealing with them individually. And then what I will do is um, go back and go over some of the changes that have been suggested from the last time we met. But first, I think to give you a, the, the big picture, um, John has a, a, a brief PowerPoint presentation. Is that going up here? It's going to be up behind us here. Um, is that going here? Um, just, to, just to ask the board, um, it, it does cover a lot of information, and I, I did notice in the interest of time that there has been a first reading, and, and, and this is the second, so I just was unsure as to how you wanted me to go about it. I, my, my overview just kind of goes over, in summary, all the things that went into the packet. I'm not sure if the board members received that, and uh, so I think at the same time there's been some already some changes that have been made. So this was created with the first set of policies. There have been revisions since then, which we'll go over. But I think it does give you a, a kind of a flavor for, for where we are anyway. So you prefer me to touch them all? <laughs> well, if you feel there's some things that you don't need to spend a lot of time on, that's, that's fine. I think people it's, would appreciate it. Just, that. John, I mean, as I recall, it seems to me that there was, um, and somebody helped me, but it, uh, it seems to me that there was a, a we were trying to, distinguish between the athletic rules and responsibilities and kind of the sign-off and, and contract uh, piece of it okay. is, is um, That's probably the thing that, right. the, we, the, that we had the most the questions. Of the changes. Yeah. That we had, the changes. We had the most but I, discussion I think about. I think part of the purpose for this is for the general public. Give okay. the overall no, perception of what, right. I mean, why, why don't I give, try, I'll try to go through it as quickly as I can and uh, if there are items of interest that you want me to provide more information or keep. Please say so. Um, before we start, the, uh, the athletic task force was comp comprised of several people. Um, there was uh, coaches, athletic administrator, the superintendent, uh, building administrators, uh, parent representatives, and uh, building administrators, as well as uh, Margie Reed and Aaron Spaulding, the student representatives. And uh, our charge was to, to go over all our policies of the school board and present them to you, the policy subcommittee, um, to make sure that what we have is, is, is giving us an athletic system that's equitable and, and successful. Um, and we decided that uh, in our first meeting in September, we divided into three groups um, to attack that. Uh, one group was the uh, philosophy subcommittee headed by Jim Rowe. I had the pleasure of being in that one. 
Um, the other one was the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. That was headed by Keith. And uh, I believe, I'm not sure, Jeff, the one that you had at administration facilities. It's a potpourri, everything else. A potpourri, <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I think all the work of the three subcommittees, it was aimed at organizing, and I really want to emphasize this, the good work that people had already done a long time ago. Uh, a lot of the pieces were already there. They just were scattered about, and really our, our big task was to bring it all together in a neat package and uh, in a cohesive fashion. Um, however, along the way, we did look at a lot of other school districts and other organizations, and, uh, and that kind of guided our discussions and, and some of the modifications that we made to our program. So. Um, no noise, no noise. Um, the very first part, if, if you're going by the packet, and I'm not sure if you have that, it would be the first page, had to do with the philosophy section. And um, basically, we, we, we tried to make sure that we connected this philosophy section to our own core academic mission that was posted in all the schools. Um, we want to make sure that athletics just extends the same um, development of skills and behaviors to become successful citizens. Um, we believe firmly that the participation is, is a privilege and not a right, um, and that uh, they have to earn that, and they're held to clear appropriate um, academic and behavioral <coughs> expectations. And we have a strong tradition that exists here in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, a lot of effort goes in by a lot of people to make our, uh, our athletic program successful for everyone involved. And there are 10 belief statements. I'm not going to take the time to read them to you. But uh, again, they, they had existed in pieces here and there. We added some from, from some other districts that we liked and thought matched our philosophies. And uh, that would be on that page on entitled Athletic Policies. Questions on that? Okay. Uh, the next one is just a, a flow chart which, which deals with obviously uh, a chain of command and uh, we stress that in the handling of uh, any concerns that we have regarding our athletic program and basically shows the organizational structure that we have. Um, third page in the packet um, dealt with um, Cape Elizabeth athletic levels and their definitions, uh, levels of competition. This came from a previous um, document that was entitled The Pyramids of Success, I believe, Jim. And uh, it just basically outlines our beliefs for each level. Um, the high school of varsity being the top, it's, uh, of course, the highest skill level. It is definitely competitive. It is tournament driven. Um, there's no entitlement to play. There are cuts. Right below that would be the junior varsity, and uh, the junior varsity serves as a feeder to the varsity and transition from the freshman program to the middle school. Uh, there are sometimes cuts. Uh, playing time is emphasized as not being equal. Uh, but there's still an emphasis on um, skill and strategy acquisition over just competitive play. And then freshman comes with strong expectation to play, to learn, to grow in a new sport, perhaps, to experiment. Um, our freshman programs are, of course, number driven. Um, sometimes we'll have a program one year, and then the next year we won't, because it's determined by the number of students. And Keith, our freshman program is funded by boosters. Funded by the school and, and boosters. Right. And our middle school has uh, the no-cut policy within parameters, um, with an emphasis on the opportunity to play and the development of skills before competition. Question. Okay. Next, um, which would be the fourth page in your packet, um, has to do with the Athletic Steering Committee. And perhaps he can speak more to this, but Basically, it's, it's comprised of um, the athletic administrator, principals from the buildings, superintendent, school board, coach, one coach, I believe, one parent, one athlete, and the president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. 
And previously, we had the uh, community services represented here also. Uh, and the input from Sue has been important. I would hopefully continue to have that input there. Uh, this, uh, the committee has met to discuss uh, budget, to discuss new programs, deal with any uh, various athletic issues. The proposal here is they would meet twice a year. One meeting would be designated as a budget meeting. Uh, the other meeting would be held at the conclusion of the athletic program to evaluate the events during the course of the year. Next one. Um, give me the next page of your packet. It deals with the science and sports. And currently we have uh, three levels of sanctions in our school. Um, the club level, the school level, the school sponsored. Right, there is the, the, the club level, which is sanctioned by the school board, but funded by uh, booster organizations. Uh, they fall, falls under all the guidelines uh, of any of our activities. The second level would be uh, that level which is considered a school sport. Do we have? Oh, I see about three of us there. Um, this is uh, similar to the, the club aspect, except uh, the school pays for part of the program, and part of the program is uh, is funded by the boosters. It depends on various activities where uh, where this falls. School sponsored sport is the final level of sanctioning. This would be the part where the school assumes uh, all the responsibilities uh, of the program, uniforms, equipment, officials, uh, you know, everything that uh, we normally would pay for. There are some instances there where the booster organizations do help out. As I mentioned before, all of our freshman teams, the school has been responsible for the coaches, for equipment, Boost has been responsible for officials and transportation. It kind of works out to a 50-50 split there. And the decision process as far as sanctioning? That, uh, as far as sanctioning, uh, applications are made to the steering committee. The steering committee uh, discusses these, and then uh, a recommendation is made to the school board. The final decision comes from the school board. And some of the factors governing sanctioning gender, feeder system, do you have the numbers to support it? Uh, is it um, supported or recognized by the MPA? Um, do we have coaches that are available to coach it? Um, would it impact the use of facilities or other sports already in play? And do we have the financial support? And I think importantly that all those decisions are on a case-by-case -case basis. And, uh, and when they're made, they, they're, they're very clearly stated as to what the rules and responsibility for each organization is, especially the boosters and support them. Right? Okay. Uh, next page in the packet deals with the booster organizations, and I think there's been a lot of talk about them lately. Um, it defines what a booster organization is. I noticed in your second reading it uh, was careful to say that participation is voluntary. Um, there's going to be the formation, it recommends the formation of a booster coordinating committee. Keith, you can probably speak to that. Right, this uh, um, one of the charges that, that Jeff and I would have the next year is the formation of this uh, booster committee. Uh, we meet three times a year, uh, made the athletic administrator, high school principal, booster reps, parents, uh, and athletes. One of our charges would be is to would be to form a bylaws, to form a booster handbook, uh, to try to get a handle on uh, on many of these activities. Uh, the superintendent would like to have this during the course of the next school year. And I think a real a real push for that is to coordinate the fundraising activities that go on during the school year. Um, next page of the packet dealt with evaluation of coaches. And one change I know that's already been made um, when I made this uh, presentation, head coaches we had thought we had talked about were evaluated every year in the first three years, every two years thereafter. I believe that's been changed to every year. Correct? Yes. Didn't I see that in the second writing? Yes. Or all one year contracts. Right. 
and uh, those involved getting together at the beginning of the season, setting uh, goals, and uh, meeting after the season and assessing the goals. Okay. Okay. We have assistant coaches, which would include um, JV as well as freshmen and middle school coaches. A written evaluation is done by the head coach and shared with the assistant every season. This is, it falls under the uh, fundraising uh, activities. Uh, basically, the principal responsible uh, for the administration and supervision uh, of the events at which admission is charged. Uh, athletically, any funds that are collected would go into the general athletic account. Uh, senior citizens uh, would be admitted free. At the, any school activities, uh, as well as all school district employees. Uh, and again, this would not apply to any activities uh, that are run, that are part of the main principal association tournament, but any of our uh, regular season events. Um, the, uh, again, any, any monies raised through uh, fundraising, gate receipts, ticket sales, uh, and so forth, uh, would be subject to this uh, policy. Uh, and again, uh, gate receipts, ticket sales, and so forth, uh, in the case of athletics anyway, would be deposited in the general athletic account. Uh, the next one, which is always probably the one of the most talked about ones, is our, is our rules and contracts um, regarding our athletes. And there's, there's 20 rules here, and there's no need to, uh, to, to, to go over them all, but I think for all those, and, and they do govern everybody. Um, not just the athletes, but the managers, statisticians, and anybody in a supporting role that's, that's helping the team, like a manager. But uh, it's, it's really important to know that there are a couple of changes for next year. And uh, for our athletes and, and for our parents, um, they really need to pay attention to rule number eight, which has to do with student tardiness. And I know Jeff has, has, has done work there in the high school, uh, as well as number 20 with the substance abuse policy. Uh, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the uh, number eight as far as student tardiness is 15 minutes after the start of the first class. And uh, they must, it, it reads, in order to participate in a game or practice, all students must be in school no later than 15 minutes after the start of class and remain in school for the entire day. And, uh, and that's the same rule goes in the middle school. So it would be, uh, right now it's 8.05 in the middle school and... 745 in high school. And, uh, and then number 20, um, substance, which refers to the substance abuse policy that we have. Um, I, I think I'll let Keith speak to that one. Um, I know that uh, we, we, we've had a different policy here. We've had several coaches who have written their own uh, rules regarding that within, within our own department of athletic rules and regulations. And Keith, the change that's before that, I should mention that there, there were two other changes. One, uh, we have I've always had a, a policy about hazing, but we never had any consequences. Uh, in, the, in the Rule 18, we, we stressed that if any violation will result in suspension from two carnival games, subsequent violations will result in suspension for the rest of the season. So we did put down consequences for, for hazing, which is something that we're really trying to get a handle on. Also, in addition here, there is a code of conduct uh, that would cover many areas. And that athletes uh, who do not conduct themselves properly, either on or off school grounds, including areas not covered by our rules and regulations, will have their actions reviewed by the head coach of that sport, the athletic director and the principal. Disciplinary actions will be determined by the principal, athletic director, and coach. Uh, this is kind of a catch-all, but we thought, thought it was important to have this uh, this code of conduct. Uh, rule uh, 20 that uh, John talked about was one that uh, the committee that I chaired uh, discussed uh, to a great extent. Uh, during the many years that I've been here, we have had so many different 
rules here and uh, as I mentioned to the committee, I, I don't know as I've seen a whole lot of change depending upon uh, what the rule is. Uh, this year we have had several teams uh, where the coaches along with the players have decided that, that any violation of the substance use means they would be off the team for the rest of that season. Um, so we have had kind of a variety of things. What we came up with what we decided was something that uh, would be worth trying is for a parent or a self-referral that that person would be suspended from two countable contests. That's in the case if there are 10 or more contests, it would be one contest if there are less than 10. If it's not a parent or self-referral, in other words, uh, if it's something that's brought to our attention, such as uh, from the, uh, as we've had recently, from the police blotter in the Cape Courier, which is how we seem to find out about some of these things, uh, would be suspension from the team for the rest of that particular sports season. Our purpose for this was to try to have uh, the kids be willing to come forward uh, with the, the parent or the self-referral. And I will say we have had that a few of those uh, occur this year. A second offense means they would be off the teams for the remainder uh, of the school year. In both cases here, it requires that they meet with the uh, school social work. Detain any questions? Uh, no, we, we actually changed it so that the... We're going to go over We're going to go over that later? Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> define substance? Yes, it's in here. I have just a question about um, not a parent or self-referral. Um, yeah. Would that cover another student's reporting of a peer? Uh, another student's reporting of a peer, which I can't say as I as, as actually happened. I mean, reporting uh, reporting to a coach. You mean? Yeah. Yeah, another that that would fall that would be that would fall into the not a parent or self referral yes. But but we cannot I think that uh, with the operators another student comes forward and says so and so is involved with uh, substance abuse and has to have a constant investigation if that word word of that student would not be taken as true. And if the investigation proved that that student had violated the contract, then they would be, that would go, and it, okay, so, just want to make sure that, but it's okay, it's word you take. It's a normal operating procedure, students come forward with information that does come from investigation, but we don't, we don't just say, well, so-and-so said it's so much true. Okay. And, and one other one. Just to add, I think it's always important that parents be informed about number 17, um, which allows coaches to write additional rules as long as they provide them in writing. Uh, most all of our coaches, whether they be high school or middle school, have coaches' handbooks uh, that they give to the players. And uh, you know, in many ways, for example, in many of the past years, our high school coaches have um, used what is now the policy for substance abuse in place of what the school policy was. But with this new policy, all coaches will follow this. Right, right. with number four. Again, coaches so may have. The new the policy sets the minimal standard. Sets the minimal standard. A coach and or a team may set a higher right. benchmark for substance, substance abuse. Not with substance. Not substance. They cannot set a higher? Not with this. The, 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 the committee felt that we need to be consistent with sports sport on that particular rule. So what this rule does, it, it gets us a little bit stricter. Some might do, but we need to be uniform in sports and sports on that particular rule. Other folks might have rules about uh, what kind of graphics uh -huh. you get there and those kind of things that are involved in that. Sport. That's a given, but I know that some, some coaches in the past have had more strike yeah, rules right. on substance abuse. As I mentioned, the school, we've had several of the teams that have done that. Right. Uh, next, um, in the last part of the packet, um, it is always, again, part of the communication piece. The role of parents is, is so important. Um, we ask them that they all see each coach's handbook. Um, we want to make sure that they see the uh, parents' code of ethics. And we also want to make sure that it's a handout that comes from the athletic department 
uh, which is entitled Parent, Coach, and a Guide. And then last, things that were not part of um, the packet, but were things that I think all of the three different subcommittees talked about. Um, and these are some of the concerns that were discussed. Um, the need for a middle school athletic administrator, um, the need to sometimes to address the gym floor in the high school, uh, the possibility of an out artificial outdoor field. Um, as we know, we have a lot of usage of our fields. They have to shut them down in the summertime um, to allow them to, uh, to breathe. And uh, this would allow, obviously, more practices to take place. Uh, lighted fields, uh, as we talk about an extended day or a longer day academically, um, that might be something that will help us uh, coordinate the athletic schedule with a longer day. Bleacher replacement in the high school gym. Uh, there's been discussions of, and Jim, maybe you can help me here with uh, an ice arena. It, it, that was like in combination with other communities, right? South Portland? The, the last I heard, uh, South Portland has some land uh, already dedicated to an ice arena. Uh, it's, it's off Highland Avenue, and they're entertaining uh, an overture from Cape Elizabeth to join them in that, in that yeah. endeavor. It would not be a school uh, uh, involvement, but it would involve uh, boosters and, and other interested people. Right. There, there's been discussion with the South Portland Athletic Administration, myself. Jeff Holden has been doing uh, quite a bit of work on this, so it is something that's being looked at. I might also mention that many of these many of these areas, such as the gym floor, uh, bleach, and so forth, are all part of the, the building committee's work. And lastly, as we all know, there's been much discussion about um, a participation fee uh, in light of the current budget situation. And I'm not sure if that was the final plan that we considered, but that was one of the ones that we were considering at the time. Um, Under the uh, athletic rules and regulations, when you discuss um, hazing and initiation of new members, is there any type of definition as to what that involves? Um, well, there isn't a definition in the proposal. I know uh, what has, has happened when some of this comes to my attention this year. I have gone to Jeff and I've asked him, you know, uh, what. Know, would we consider that hazing or harassment or, or whatever it is? That's, there's always a fine line there. Uh, and I, can't, uh, I, mean, I can't give you an exact definition. Yeah. I don't know if Jeff can or Tom can. One of the things we, and I'm sure for the policy thing, we discussed that you know, we talked a lot about the boosters being really clear about what, what the roles are, uh, coaches and having a coach's handbook. Uh, you know, we have a great student academic handbook. Some of these things need to be clear. Uh, you know, the rules are uh, very general, but does everyone always understand them? Um, the thought is that maybe each athlete should be given some sort of an athlete's um, you know, handbook, similar to the, the academic handbook that would define what hazing is and give examples. <coughs> Might even put in there some sort of a QA, you know, what does this mean or if I'm involved with this? If I'm in a situation I think, I think coaches can, can make an easy addition to their own handbook to help make that clear and define that. Thank you. Great job, John. Keith, yeah. nice job.
Yeah. Okay. That light's too much. Um, has the MPA um, looked at the issue of supplements at all, dietary supplements at all? So since the last time we met, and, I, and I, I think because there are so many of these, it was good to get an overview of what all of these policies mean and, and to, again, bring them all together. Um, there were several suggestions at, at the last uh, board meeting, and the policy committee did discuss some of those recommendations that, that came from the school board, um, one of them being under athletic rules and regulations. Um, making it a little bit more clear as to, um, for a student as far as uh, the rules, and then maybe the um, contract should be something different. So what we took a stab at as a policy committee was separating the contract from the rules and regulations. Um, and the contract becomes more like a real contract, um, a separate sheet where the, the student actually, student athlete is actually agreeing to what is in the policy. Um, there's also not just an understanding of what it says, but an agreement that they will abide. Um, and then the athlete signing off on that. Uh, not only that they understand what the, what the rules are and what the consequences are, and they agree to abide by the substance abuse policy, but there's also, we went a little bit further and because we never had anything in the contract that you know, I, I really understand what all these rules mean. It brought up the question that we need to do, maybe do a little more education with the students in defining some of these rules. There's a list of, of 20 rules, but which each one of them um, is a little bit different. Um, do they know what the main principles association and what those guidelines are? And I don't know if we ever explained that, but if we had something in writing that went a, an, into a bit more detail, it might make that easier. Um, and also a separate section for the parent to sign um, regarding the um, rules and regulations and substance abuse policy. It falls a bit short of one of the recommendations at the last meeting uh, that the parent would agree that they would um, cooperate by, um, for lack of a better way to say it, turning in their child um, if, they, if they know that their child has um, abuse of substance. Um, it doesn't go that far, but it does um, encourage the parent to abide by all the rules, regulations, and the substance abuse policy. Um, and as a sentence, that deals a little bit with sportsmanship because the, we felt that was something that was important. It makes it a little bit cleaner. Um, I think we might be able to even clean this up a little bit more with some suggestions. And I know Susan and I had a conversation today about some other things. Maybe we can, we can work on this a little bit more, so any suggestions you might have. But that was at least an, an attempt to make that a, a cleaner document. Any questions about that one? I, I do have a comment, and it's kind of related to what Elaine said. Um, uh, two comments, actually. One is it, it alludes to the between season. And, and I wonder if we don't need one more thing that says if, in fact, it's, it's during the school year and the person was going to play an athletic season after that, second offense, you know, if it happens in September and you've got a baseball player and it's his second offense, he will not be playing baseball. Is that right? I mean, I, I think we're saying that. I, I, I think we kind of, in, in one place we say one thing, in another place we say it carries over I really would like to specifically say, if between seasons, it will affect. Well, in the very first paragraph on the uh, athletic substance abuse policy, that was filed JJJR1. But it also says it in the... It says at the end of that paragraph, in bold print, substance use is prohibited throughout the school year and not just through a sports team. Right. And, and it said that last year. And in last year, when the rubber met the road, parents found room to misinterpret that. And so what I would like to really clarify in case there's any doubt in anybody's mind, if in fact a kid comes forward at any time in the year 
and has an athletic season at any other time in the year if that will be it for some reason we say it here but believe it or not there's room for misinterpretation or question and and when it comes to that parents i hate to say it but parents will take the opportunity to question it and i think and and we talked today that might be a good place to have um all athletes be given some sort of a and, and have that question posed and do a q a for them that if this happens you know this is the consequence because i People interpret these rules differently. I don't know how much more we can say in here as far as policy and as far as the contract, because it would get quite lengthy to go into an explanation. Here's the situation. This, what will, this is what will happen. But I think we need to make sure we <coughs> educate the athletes at some point in time about the rules. And, and the only place, you know, we could say a parent is self-referral or suspension from team until two countable contests have been played. Um, you know, it, if the season consists of 10 or more contests, I mean, we even go into the number of contests that remain at that point. I don't think it would hurt to say one more sentence. Mm -hmm. if, if it's prior to the beginning of a season, it will, ex you know, impact. I, again, I think, I think people forget if they do it in September, it's going to impact May. It really is. Just so Except I think for the fact that these teams kids teams won't teams even teams get teams. this, if they only play the one sport, they won't get it till hand. May. They, they receive all this all in the student handbook, which they receive from the school year. Yeah. yeah that's okay. Yeah. The other, um, the other room, I, I think, and maybe that's the example, but that Elaine speaks to is you've got a group of six kids, and this is, this is, all right, we'll be more, more direct. A group of t twelve kids, who are kind of outed about one incident. If a number of those kids self-report, the consequence will be. Um, that, you know, kind of not as stringent. If those four kids who self-report then out the other eight kids, the other eight kids are off the team. That's our intent, and I really do think if that's our intent, we need to give that specific example. If the other four kids, can you explain that? The kids, 12 kids are involved, four kids self-report before the administration finds out. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe for hours, <laughs> but before the administration finds out. And the other eight kids do not self-report. And in that dialogue, those eight kids are outed. If the names come up and they come from those four, that would prompt, as we said before, an investigation. But if those other kids choose to lie, they would not have a consequence. Right. 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 Well, OK. So but there were, it, I, I guess, but again, that's be, another example. And Elaine brings it up. And I think it's a good one. And I think it's one we go through every year. Right. And so I, I, I think one of the important things that Tom just said is those kids would choose to lie, which is what they do, but worse than that, the parents lie for them all. I agree. I agree. And, but I, I really think they have less opportunity to lie if, in fact, we point to this very example. This is, here, this is what we don't want, mm -hmm. and, and here's what it looks like. So that when they read it in September and it comes up again in March, we can kind of refresh their memories. Remember what we said in September? I'm just trying to be clearer and clearer earlier in this process because I know when, when it gets painful, you don't think that it's it, back down. I just read this and I think that it says that in that first paragraph. And so then when we give the examples okay. in the next level the of examples information. Examples will probably be more meaningful. That's fine. Right. That's okay. fine. And I was even at the policy subcommittee meeting and I didn't notice this. Um, in these, and I'm looking at the same one, JJJR1. Our rules and guidelines are meant to, I believe, um, be guidelines for sports grades 7 through 12. And what, on our consequences, we have what's going to happen if you're a high school student, you're going to meet with a high school social worker. Right. Always before in our other policies, mm -hmm. if the 7 through 12, but I think we just need some wordage in there that at the middle school, you would meet with middle school guidance counselors. We do not have a school social worker, but we do have guidance counselors. What number are you that. referring to, Nancy? Um, this is on it's, it's, the violate it, when you get to the violations, or any. It's actually in a couple of different places, but um, where it says like first offense, you know, you'll meet with a high school social worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we need to to just add since we're going to take this back anyway, we need to be sure we add some wording that if you're a middle school student you'd meet with the middle school guidance counselor. Do we simply, be sure that we have that. Do we simply take out the words high school and put in meeting with the appropriate social worker slash guidance counselor? Uh, that's another way to do it, yes. But there are a couple of different places right around 
these belief statements yeah. where I didn't catch that the other day. I apologize. The, the new line that says the policy extends to all students involved in, the, in extracurricular activities. We took that, that, I think we took that out. Yeah. It's still in there. Is that still in there? Right, it's still it's, in there, but we did take it out. Oh. It's in there on this, but we, we did take it out. it out at the policy meeting. So this is an athletic policy? As of right now, because the, the conversation was that the nature of some of the extracurricular activities um, because there aren't contests yeah. uh, that we need to take a look at maybe each one of those activities and figure out what their policy would look like. Uh, it's too simple to say this right now because then when you try to implement it, it doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, so since all of our policies, and I think I'm correct in saying that as we got into this, we really divorced ourselves from the um, extracurricular activities because they all didn't work and we need to deal with them separately as another, another group of I, I would hope that you would want this policy to be for all extracurricular activities. The violations might be different. Right, we want I the policy. The policy should be the same for all activities. We do, but it doesn't always work. It's not that we don't want the policy, but the violations will be different. So, so strictly to say that all of this is for all extracurricular, it might not work for all. So we need to take a look at that. And that wasn't the charge of the athletic task force. I think the intent is to create a parallel uh, set of rules for co-curriculars, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we hope to. And uh, when that happens, that'll address that, that variance, I think, key. I guess what bothers me, so what you're saying is that the athletes would have to be there 15 minutes before, after the start of school, but anybody participating in a play, speech, debate, grammar, they can come whenever they want? Well, that, no. That rule will likely come forward in the co-curricular uh, rules. Again, that we just haven't gotten that far, but we, a lot of the rules will be very similar. Because a lot of these rules, Keith, if we say all these rules extend to extracurricular, we talk about MPA. Um, a lot of them are very specific to athletics. We'd have to come up with a parallel set of rules for co-curricular because just to simply say all these rules apply, they don't fit. So we need to review them, which ones do fit. The 15 minutes before school happens to be one that does fit for many activities. Some of these don't. So we need to, to review that and we just didn't have time to get into that piece. Can I make a statement? that is actually should be interpreted as a question. The principal of the high school has the right to establish whatever rules and regulations he wants to relate to the tardiness of students, regardless of whether or not it's a school board policy. That's what I was going to say. Question mark. We do have, we do have right now in our, in our school handbook uh, rules about tardiness and rules. And in my opinion, the rules would be Would fit the co curricula. Jeff, when all is said and done, you have a tardy rule for students who are for students, right. regardless of whether they're athletes, regardless of whether they're thespians, uh, or participate in nothing other than hopefully classes. Um, same thing with the substance abuse policy, and that's, I have a question there as well. Um, on the, I, I mean, I'm deaf on substance abuse. Um, 
particularly drugs and alcohol and we have a student we have a policy that applies to all students does and my question would be does a student who happens to be an athlete suffer the consequences of both policies No, I understand that. But if, should the athlete violate the policy on campus? Then they would be separable. They would suffer an athletic consequence, and they would also suffer the same school consequence as any other school. The other change um, that the policy committee um, discussed was under uh, fundraising uh, and boosters, and John made reference to it that. Um, to make sure it's clear in the policy that at no time shall a student be required to participate in fundraising activities, um, that it's not a requirement of any team for a student to participate in fundraising. And it's not a requirement for any parent to be a member of a booster organization. And that is also a voluntary activity. Um, and, and I agree with what we're saying here. I think in the past where it's gotten muddled is Coaches somehow communicate to parents that there's a mandatory meeting. Mm -hmm. The parents show up at the mandatory meeting, and it happens to be a booster fundraising meeting. There might be some discussion of rules, or there might be no discussion of team expectations, and it really is, this is what we're doing for our next fundraiser. So this might help that, and I think the handbook has got to take another, mm -hmm. you know, take another stab at it. Uh, and I do have a question on, um, D are we talking about DFR? Yes. Should I raise that now? Mm -hmm. um, a couple questions. One is, under guidelines for all fundraising groups, under E, all funds raised shall be strictly accounted for. Do, do we need to get any more specific than that? It's, that feels... Does that get tighter in some other... In accordance with generally accepted accounting principles? Well, maybe. I, I'm not being that facetious. Maybe. Maybe. A little, but not too much. Yeah, so that's, uh, it seemed kind of loose, and I thought maybe okay. we wanted to be more specific. Under student school based fundraising, uh, and I know this was maybe on here last month, what, 45 minutes? Students shall not miss more than 45 minutes? It's, that seems like an arbitrary. Is there, what's driving that? This, if it, this particular policy is the fundraising policy is not, is not part of, it, it relates to athletics, but this, in, this is about all fundraising. I think that relates to Chwonky. That's like time that they, fundraising. it's more not athletic fundraising. It's if there's an activity to inform kids about, I don't know. What, well, it's like, I think in like in the middle school, yeah. but we have a magazine drive and the kids all come in and learn about how to do it. So it's all you can't, but you can't take more than 45 minutes of class yeah. to do that. Okay. So okay. They're, not, they're missing instructional. So no one has to track that one student somehow participated in more than 45 minutes over a school year or anything? Oh, no, this is still not very missing arbitrary. 45 minutes of instructional time. Okay. So that would be set up. But even right. so, I mean, if, right. yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and the other question I had was on um, B under there. Activities undertaken by students must be approved in advance by the Student Advisory Council, athletic administrator, or the principal. And, and I'm guessing the principal needs to approve that anyway. I'm not, un I'm not clear as to why there, that would be an or situation. Yeah, and we changed that in some of the other policies. I think in most of those fundraising activities, we had both. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. We did change it in one of the others, but neglected yeah. to do it here. Yeah, on the next page. Okay. Um, on the next page, under um, Section C, therefore, school-affiliated fundraising should be limited to providing items which are not normally included in the school budget. Um, okay, and you said somewhere else it's, that it's voluntary. Um, I'm not sure if we shouldn't put one more thing that says, and participation voluntary, or participation is completely voluntary. Um, maybe we've already said it. Okay. Uh, 
and the only other question i had was under school affiliated fundraising maybe we should bring f down revenue and expenditure report shall be submitted to the principal that that should be true under school affiliated fundraising also right mm -hmm. and should that be under maybe that's what it should say under the first one where i just kevin and i were kind of questioning Maybe that's what it should say under guidelines for all fundraising groups. Revenue and expenditure reports shall be submitted. It, it might as well be consistent, right? And I think that's what we're shooting for. So if, if a team has a car wash, mm -hmm. This would be a fundraising group, the booster at a car wash. Mm -hmm. And the money at the end of the day was given to the coach, which would then be the responsibility of going into a booster fund, not the athletic general fund. Right. It needs to be deposited. To the, to the booster group directly. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and we're saying that we need to have a report generated to whom? to the Same. principal about how much money was raised in the course of fundraising, what the expenditures were, yeah. what the revenues are at this point. So some sort of report, has, financial report, must be generated and submitted. I agree with that. Okay. Which I don't think happens now, does it? No. Do we actually have coaches who are taking on the responsibility of handling those funds? I don't. I think, it's, I think it's usually the booster group. I mean, I would like to think it's the booster groups. Well, I was going to bring know. that up on the next page, but I have written numerous co checks to coaches in the past year for warm-ups, for camps. And, and so I'm, I, I'm guessing that on the next page that should be addressed. I had a note at the bottom, banking policies and bank accounts. I really don't think it's a good idea for parents to be writing checks to employees of the school department. And I think that's part of that. that it should be either to the booster group or to the, the school. Yeah, or, so. uh, and I would add to that, or to a parent who happens to be the president or treasurer of the should booster go to group. the organization. Certainly is not to cast dispersions on that individual, but it's a lot safer for them. Uh, right. n you know, if, that, if all checks are payable to the Cape Elizabeth Baseball Booster Group or the Hockey Booster Group or whatever. Right. And, Ra and rather than coach so-and-so or, yeah, I absolutely agree with and, that. And I think that needs to be addressed as part of the fundraising piece, but I also think it needs to be addressed under the athletic booster organizations also, because it might not be a fundraiser the under the next page, which was um, DFAB, athletic booster organizations. Something about accounting because it's not always a fundraiser. We'll, someone will come home and say, you need to write a check to coach so-and-so for our, our warm-up, and we do it. Mm -hmm. And I think some here, it's not a fundraising event, but it's also something that I think we need to put under the athletic boost organization policy. Something about they have to have a separate funding, a separate account, and all checks will be made payable to them. And as Kevin said, not an employee of the school, not a president of the club. And, and I think so. I think that has to go in two places, basically. Mm -hmm. Can I make a suggestion? Um, because I, I think this was an outstanding piece of work for everybody who was involved. It's taken years to get done. Back in when I chaired policy, we tried to do this, and we got bog completely bogged down in separating out sports from extracurricular from co-curricular. And those are the things that made trying to do this a failure in the past. Uh, my suggestion would be that these are some pretty good policies. Uh, and I'd like to suggest that we move forward with adopting them tonight and then charge the appropriate group with going through and, I mean, we could pick these apart forever and a day. And a lot of, I've heard a lot of good suggestions here, but let's get the policy in place so we're sure to have something in place because I think we've got a couple of very busy months coming at us. And during those months, take a look at those um, and do the wordsmithing going forward rather than sit without a policy at all. Well, well we did make the agreement gonna, yeah, we were gonna from the beginning that we'd bring them back a third time. Oh, okay. That's, I was unaware Just because, of Just because of what you're saying, because they're, 
I mean, I think the more you look at it, the more you find. Absolutely. But you're right. At some point, we've got to say, let's move forward. Yeah. And maybe the, ne the next time might be the time. You know, to and that. to me, just this new contract and the new regulations are well worth adopting all by themselves and moving forward from there. Well, and I think in defense of the people who have done it, they've done an outstanding job. And I think when you've lived with it for this long, you stop being able to see it and you really rely on other people to come at it with some fresh energy. So that I, that's the energy I tried to muster. Ab absolutely. To try and get them over the last and, and figure they can't do that. They need that from us. So that's where, whether it's here or... Well, notes, I don't and that's guess. that's what I'm thinking is that if we who were not intimately involved in this production this time went back, read it over, came up with our suggestions, submitted them, but in the meantime we'd have some policy, some basic policy in place. Well, and, and as far as process, and that no, normally you, you want to get all those questions out after the first reading, and, and as of the second reading, if we weren't agreed upon a, a third time then the question shouldn't be coming out at the second reading. With these policies, we agreed on a third time. Um, there shouldn't be questions and changes the next time they come to the board. All those should have come out. Um, but we, had, we, set a, we set a different set of rules. That's, that works for me. The last, the last question that came up, and it, it isn't a change, but has come up, um, under evaluation of coaches, and I, I think it, it, it merits some attention by the policy committee to take another look at it. Um, and that has to do with the evaluation of middle school coaches. Um, and the question is, is it doable? Um, and that's something I know we talked about as a task force, probably deserves, I don't know what, it, what it deserves some more conversation. I know, Susan, you had some issues with it. I don't know what the answer is and how we deal with it. Um, and maybe that's in training with coaches, but probably deserves some more conversation. And I don't, I don't have an answer, um, and neither did the task force, but it probably deserves some more conversation. Right, and, and I, my concern with that is that at the point we are now, we're not hiring coaches to be supervisors, and they're new. I mean, we have, if you bring in a new coach, and you haven't necessarily hired that person to be a supervisor, and, and that's the person that people say, middle, an example is middle school parents are going to go to when they have a problem with something that's happening at the middle school level. We're not sure who this person is. We've not, you, you, when you have team leaders, they, they've kind of been around and, and they get chosen because of job performance, and yet I, I have trouble having a supervisor new on the job. We can in the future, I think, when we tighten up the job description and the expectations, but I think with the current staff, I think we're kind of going to be caught in the middle, and it concerns me. Any other questions on the athletic policies? Just, um, just a couple of things, too. And, and I think that we're doing exactly what we should be doing, and, and, and hopefully it's not being regarded as nitpicking, because um, the committee has done an excellent job of really kind of bringing this to another level of organization. Is somebody kind of keeping a master account of the notes? OK. Not only that, we reviewed the we reviews the tape of this meeting to make sure we don't miss it. It's so exciting, I need to see the meeting twice. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. You know the time has gone into this. <laughs> Yikes. Um, can we just kind of go through, just kind of sort through them quickly and see if there's any other additions? There's a, I just saw a couple little things that are really not big things, but well, since I we're cleaning, we might as well clean. I just want it, Tom, I wrote it down for myself, but if you want to put it on your thing, just put sweatshirts and I'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. Sweatshirts. When we talk about it. Well, I, I was just thinking, for some groups, like you were talking about a strict accounting. I, I know in middle school, and I did it myself um, last fall for the cross-country girls, they made it to states. They don't have any warm-ups, any anything. I called Postal, what's it going to cost if we get sweatshirts made up? I paid for them because they needed to be paid for. I had people reimburse me. It's happened in middle school before the kids decide they want a sweatshirt that says soccer or whatever on it. I'd hate to sort of have such strict accounting rules. But were you acting as, as a member of the Booster Club? There wasn't, there isn't a Booster Club. No, well I don't. You're acting as there, a, as there's a some booster club. There's some account. I don't know if it's track or. Cross country. At the middle school. Is it track? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, if we didn't pull any money from them, but. I don't know if that's just a parent saying, I'm going to order these sweatshirts, do you want it, then this is what's right. going to cost. Okay. Or is well, I, I guess my concern is I don't want to discourage those kinds of things mm -hmm. because it's happened, I know, in middle school, how many kids want a sweatshirt, I'll order them, and that's been done by a parent. Um, I don't think that's part of a, okay. a booster fundraiser, I wouldn't think. It's just people paying money for I'm more concerned when the coach says, you know, send in a $92 check tomorrow, we need shoes, and, and have your parents yeah. make it out to me. Okay. I think that's more a school concern. Okay. Well, I just, anyway. Okay. Can we just go through these one last time and just kind of, um, there is a first reading on the table here in terms of DBAA, and is there any input on any of that? Because this will come back that's for a second a reading. special ed one. Right. Special Ed authorization to commit district funds for special education. If, if Claire, if you could just take a minute to clarify the, the Special Ed DBAA authorization to commit district funds for special education. Yeah, the way our policy is written right now, um, the state is telling us that we need to make some changes because it's not in compliance with what they're looking for. Um, it looks like we ha have predetermined decisions prior to going to meetings, and that's why we have to reward it and remove the three tiers that we had had previously. Okay. Questions or comments about this? Because otherwise we can just move, move on. It. Um, the first uh, athletic one I'm looking at is JJJ-R. I think this is the order that we got them in. Um, number 17, um, and approved by the administration. One, um, this is the, the, um, the rules set forth by the coach. Why shouldn't that just be by the, um, by the athletic director? The athletic director is the, in the chain of accountability is the, is the person. Which one are you on? JJJ-R. The rules. Number 17, athletic, um, athletes uh, will abide by additional rules set forth by coaches. These will be given out in writing. And, and uh, it wasn't up here on this piece, but uh, apparently a new change is and approved by the administration. And I, I just suggested, uh, well, what, is, what does that mean? The athletic director or? I would assume, yes. Is that right, Keith? Uh, I guess so. But any rules, Keith, that, that the coaches have, I know that they have to be cleared through you. Right. So okay. You have to those. So why not just say that? Um, I think Elaine brought up a good point, which is number 18, and it does talk about hazing, and I had I had something about that too. I don't know if, there, it, and I think we've already established people don't know what hazing is, or we don't have a definition of it. I think rather than uh, leaving it to every coach to 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 decide what hazing is, maybe we could give a brief description of what hazing is, so that people know. And I thought we were going to do that in the handbook, but not in the, not in the policy. But you wanted in the policy, the brief description? Well, it could be another year before we have a handbook. The, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this, I, think there's, I think there's, a, there's probably a, like yeah. a five sentence, I mean five sentence, five word sentence that describes it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or a just some clarification. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, and I have one more uh, question, George. On, on 17, athletes would, will abide by additional rules set forth by the coaches. An example of one that I think I personally have had trouble with is coach, some coaches make it a rule that you have to ride home on the bus from an away event. And sometimes, some of those night hockey games, I mean, uh, soccer games might get out at like 9.30 on a Monday night. And, and kids That's have not early. been home. What? That's early. Well, <laughs> kids have not been home to do homework. And, and I really think if we are an educational organization, I would like to have maybe the building principals look at that just with the eye of balancing education. I understand it's good for camaraderie. I understand you probably have a good dialogue on the bus. But the point is you haven't been home yet, and you've got two hours of homework to do, and the, the extra half hour you're going to save by going home with your parents who have gone to the game anyway, that's, that's why I would like a little bit of building administration input, maybe. So that's covered under 16. I well, we said 17. These will be out. In, these will be given out in writing and approved by the administration. I, I'm not sure it shouldn't be athletic director and building administration or building principal. Just, I don't. I don't know. Uh, 
My only comment is on 16. There's no or else. A student may be released to his or her own. It deals parents. with transportation in number 16. Yeah, students may not trans transport themselves or other students, period, or yeah. else. They may be released to his or her own parents. Yeah, but when you get right. to the may not transport themselves or other students, there's no or else. I mean, if they do transport themselves, what happens? Oh, uh-oh. I think you know, what she is getting at is in that Rule 16, it says may be released. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that they have to be. And there are, there are coaches who do ask that the kids drive to and from the front desk. I think we're talking about two different things. We are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yours relates to rules that the coaches may make. And that's one of them, as some coaches may. They do. They do. And I would, I would like someone else to be able to look at that and maybe, um, you know, have some input to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's page two of that. Anything else there? Um, the athletic, I mean, yeah, athletic substance abuse policy, I think we went through that pretty, uh, pretty good. There were a couple of things that have been changed there. Anything else? Um, just as I think we get value in, in, in defining certain codes of conduct, um, where the parent signs, uh, they will conduct themselves in a manner reflecting the ideals of good sportsmanship. Um, do we want to define as described in the parents' code of ethics? Is it conduct book that's given out to the parents? Oh, we just just make that statement as described in the parents' right. code of ethics. Right. So that there, it's clear as to what's acceptable behavior. Force them to read the code of ethics too. Right. Yes. <laughs> and come to the meeting and get it. <laughs> so there's a reference there. Um, so we're on the athletic contract now. It does just a, a little typo is at the bottom. Athletic vent instead of event. Yeah. Needs to be changed. Um, fundraising administrative procedure, DF-R, um, there were some things looked at here, and other, any, anything else? Um, the athletic booster organizations, DFAB, sanctioning of sports, JJIF. Personnel records, GBL, not necessarily um, related to athletics. It's probably not a reason for this not to just yeah. be approved. Somebody want to make a motion on that one? Let's clean, we can clean this up. I move that we adopt file GBL personnel records policy. Need a second? Um, I, oh, okay. okay. Need uh, I'll wait. Second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Jim? I, I prefer to wait and, and uh, approve them as a group. This, this has this nothing is to do with to athletic, um, I understand so. that. Okay. But I, that doesn't mean I won't act on it if somebody else would like to second. I just don't want to second. Okay. <laughs> we had a, a motion. Do I have a second? Guess not. I, I think. Well, the motivation for this was partly athletic. I think that's why it's in here. And that's my concern with that. Right. All right, let's put, um, I'm not seeing a second, so we're not getting any ac action on it. Let's put it, keep it in. Is there any comments that anybody wants to make on it so that we don't come back at this and then start dissecting it then? The same comment that I had last time, which I am still concerned about a, well, now it could be a varsity coach having letters in a file that aren't necessarily in the official file that still are, um, you know, any, anybody can ask for and, and I think legally have to be presented. And, and I, there aren't any, but any we've guidelines. we've by legal counsel that's not necessarily so. So do we, do we not deal with it at all? Is that, we, we wait till it gets... It doesn't need to be addressed in the policy. So... Because once we address it in the policy, then we kind of... Put ourselves, back ourselves into a corner. So we don't need any guidelines for any supervisor in any building about probably, what that person. We probably need the guidelines for administrators and how to deal with that issue. But I don't know if it needs to be part of. We've been told that it would probably be best not to address it in policy. Okay. Okay. 
just because it's not clear as to the ruling on that in an educational setting. Okay. This is, you know, this really talks about an official personnel file. At no time will information be placed in an employee's file without the employee's notification. You know, I, I'd, I'd go even further and say nothing should be in the, in the employee's official personnel file that they don't have a copy of. Right. Right. And right. there's only one official personnel record. Right. And, but the problem that we ran into was there were other records. And when the well, records no, were there requested... Were, there was one record and it just wasn't, it wasn't housed. We've had issues with records. We didn't keep a personnel file uh, for coaches, an official record. Okay. So there was only so the one record that existed became the official record. Okay. Okay. If you're comfortable with that, we would resolve the athletic debacle around uh, around you know personnel issues and producing documents that an employee is entitled to and where those documents are kept They're housed here in the central office in a personnel file, okay. which for all coaches hadn't happened in the past. Okay. Okay, um, athletic policy sanctioning of sports. Did I already? That one? Anything on that one? DFD-R uh, gate receipts. Um, just yell out if there's anything. Athletic policy philosophy and beliefs. Um, athletic administrative guidelines philosophy and beliefs, um, JJI-R, which is the athletic department flow chart. I just, I just made a suggestion that the Cape Elizabeth School Board believes in the importance of the chain of accountability versus command. Accountability is, um, I think. Where was this, George? It's just the introduction of it. It's just a wordsmithing of, of um, JJI-R philosophy and beliefs. The Cape Elizabeth School yeah. Board believes in the importance of the chain of accountability with regard to all of its programs. And then down below is basically the chart. Um, that continues on to a second page. Then there is uh, Athletic Steering Committee, JJIA, and there is JJIG, which is the evaluation of coaches. So we can kind of close uh, the input on this and, and ask that these kind of be prepared for a final, a final review and, and basically final review at our next board meeting. Okay. Um, we are now moving on to consideration of this, got through that, uh, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation to athletic fee positions for the spring of 2002. Papers all over the place. Here. Um, we have at the high school um, a fellow by the name of Tim Forsella who's working with outdoor track um, and returning middle school nominations Drew Riddle, seventh grade baseball, David Kinsella, seventh and eighth grade track, uh, Kim Sturgeon, seventh and eighth grade track, and Matt Whaley, expansion baseball. Is there a motion? Elaine, thanks. I move that we accept the nominations um, from Dr. Pasella for the okay. positions. Okay, thanks. Second, Jim, thanks. <coughs> um, questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7 0. Uh, we need to now look at uh, consideration of the school calendar for 2002 2003 school year. The school calendar you have in front of you has uh, generated quite a bit of discussion. Um, there, we've had input uh, from parents, uh, from staff. Um, one of our concerns with this calendar was, um, was trying to, making an attempt to uh, make it a smoother school year uh, with less disruptions. Um, so the big difference in this particular calendar is uh, a reduction in the number of early release late start days uh, from the eight that we have now. That will be, the number will be three for next year. We've also 
two of the full teacher professional development days um, will be taken out of this calendar and the proposal is uh, that teachers will be given the responsibility of conducting those full day workshops at other times. For instance, um, if uh, the math department at the high school um, is, is their professional development plan deals with grading math assessments, um, that work can be done during April vacation if they're going to be around at that time. It could be done during the summer. Um, it could be work that would be broken up if they'd like and do two hours after school for so many days. Um, but it would all be part of a movement toward creating personal professional growth plans by all of our employees. Um, and they would have the responsibility and be accountable for how they, they use that time. What that does, it probably is a better use of time because the work that needs to be done isn't always on the day that we say it, it, it has to be done. Um, and it also loosens up the calendar because as we added more and more professional days, uh, it had a huge impact on the calendar and, and just created a calendar that, that was very difficult um, to put together and to end it at a reasonable time. Um, so I think those two um, uh, changes have a significant impact on the calendar and does make for a smoother calendar uh, with less disruptions. Aside from that, it looks, it, the rest of it is, is quite similar vacations at the same time um, that we've had them in the past and the other professional days in similar places. Okay. And uh, this is uh, in front of us for approval this evening or, no, this or uh, come, come back this for another back, review? Um, parents have been calling. Um, so if there, are, if, if there are major oppositions, um, if you could voice those, those now so we can give parents at least what do you think the chances are they're looking for setting vacation days and all. Um, and that's the major issues, the start of school um, and the vacation schedules where parents are looking for right now um, so they can set their plans. Um, so basically trying to get a sense from, just from a the sense board as to whether or not there's any, any uh, st strong opposition to, to what they're seeing in front of them now. At least the major pieces of the calendar. Okay. Why don't we just open that up? I'm not seeing a whole lot of. Um, I'm, I'm fine with the children. You know, I think I, I think what we did with the late starts or early release, um, I, I think was was worthwhile. It was uh, in response to a need, um, and you learn and you grow and you evolve. Um, I think one of the one of the concerns always is trying to balance, um, you know, a, a continuity and a and a flow. Um, and it, and it couldn't help but to disrupt that a bit. And I think we've now maybe come up with a better solution and, and an improved solution. I think people do really like the, um, the other, uh, certainly the November piece where the, um, you know, where the uh, development days ha happen um, at the beginning of the week. We had our highest absences at that time anyway during that November period, Thanksgiving period. The other, the other, there is a discussion that's been taking place at the schools regarding the start of the school day, and, uh, and that doesn't impact the days where they are placed in the calendar. That discussion is still going on um, regarding, you know, does the day start differently, um, and, and hopefully in that way there can we can conduct some of those professional collaborative type activities before school or after school, gives us some flexibility with that. Um, that discussion and, and where we're going with that, we're not sure yet, but that does not have an impact on the calendar itself and where the days are in the calendar. Right. Any other comments about this? Sounds like people can probably move ahead with their vacation planning based on what this, uh, what this looks like and we'll continue to take some input from people and um, we'll look at this for um, approval next uh, meeting. Okay, um, consideration of a teacher's request for unpaid leave of absence for 2002-2003 school year. Uh, you have in front of you a letter from Lydia Schilt who has been, who has requested an unpaid leave and um, has um, some definite educational plans she would like to pursue. Um, um, talking to, to Nancy Hutton, we. She feels, and I agree, that it's, it's an educational opportunity that the, the teacher will profit by, 
and when she returns, so will, so will the students. And it's an unpaid leave. Okay, and I think this requires board action. Um, is there a motion, Jim? I would move that we approve the request of Lydia Schilt for a, uh, an unpaid leave of absence for the 2002-2003 school year. Yep. Um, second. Lane, thanks. Questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. We're now going to move on to consideration of the 2002-2003 school budget. Um, and uh, I'm going to move it back over to Kevin in terms of his role as financial finance chair. When we interrupted the finance committee meeting tonight, we were still discussing Jeff Shedd's proposal, um, which would reduce uh, requested personnel at the high school, free up space, require the purchase of a mobile um, math computer lab, as well as using ed techs for um, study halls as opposed to teachers. Uh, I certainly like that part. Um, and we were also, um, one, one of the uh, perhaps controversial pieces of it would be the result that under this plan there would be no Latin. Um, established as a program, as a language program next year. So based on that, I will throw it back out to the rest of the board for their comments and questions. We had a public, a public a person in the public that wanted to speak to this, I think. Mm -hmm. We have anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to this? Yes, please. If you would just introduce yourself. And Hopefully I'm awake enough to be coherent. <laughs> um, my name is Gail Atkins, and I'm here to speak about the Latin issue. About a year and a half ago, I obtained signatures of 296 parents representing 638 Cape Elizabeth students. And these parents all wanted to see Latin introduced into the high school curriculum. Um, as you may be aware, we are the only local high school that does not offer a Latin program to their students. And when I hear talk about other schools offering all-day kindergarten and trying to be competitive with other schools, um, I can't help but think, why aren't we being competitive with Latin? Um, I had met with, with Mr. Fisella and, the, and Pete Dawson last year, and um, everyone seemed in favor of introducing Latin, um, but because of budget issues, uh, the money was going to go towards the middle school last year, and indications led me to believe that money would this year be budgeted towards the high school because of the growing bubble of students moving up into the high school um, and the need for additional courses for these students. Um, it was, you know, I was happy to see that it was offered as part of the course curriculum, and it's my understanding that 50 plus students have signed up for Latin which I think is phenomenal for a first year attempt. Um, I'm distressed and as are some of the parents that I spoke with, I had just learned of all of this yesterday and not having really a list of who had signed up for Latin, I was kind of grasping at straws, just calling people um, out of the school directory and saying, by the way, did your child sign up for Latin? Um, trying to, to drum up some support here. I did lose, lose um, uh, some people, like the hour got a little late and, and they left. Um, but the, the parents were concerned and um, many of them has felt, have felt that this was a long time coming. Um, I know one, one fellow, a doctor, his wife is a nurse and their daughter is going to be a senior and their comment was um, better late than never. And I feel that, that this is a program that needs to be implemented in the school. I understand there's a budget crunch, um, and it irritates me every time I drive through um, <laughs> town and look at our eighth wonder of the world um, and take my children to sporting events next to the dump and see a sign that is nicer than our school signs. Um, money is being spent everywhere, and it's not being spent in the school system. Um, 
so i guess i'm here begging for the funding for these fifty plus students and those that are following in their wake that would like to have the opportunity to take latin and the program i think needs to get started and my my fear is that every year there's going to be which of course there is um, a budget crunch i lived in Cape Elizabeth for a long time. I have children that have been through the entire school system. And, you know, I remember when home economics went, um, there, there always is a budget crunch. And um, I just, I, I think that this is the wrong course to cut. Um, it's, it's a proven um, course that benefits students. It benefits them with their command of the English language, their knowledge of grammar. Um, benefits them in their, their understanding of, and, and, um, of foreign languages. It <clears throat> improves their SAT scores. I mean, this isn't a course, you know, the history of rock and roll or something. This is a proven um, benefit to students. And I think um, we're being short-sighted after finally getting it on the curriculum, getting students signed up um, in cutting this program. Um, there are some families that have, have taken it uh, um, upon themselves to hire tutors for their students. And you know, this is a financial benefit uh, or a financial burden to the family. It's also a time burden. I mean, we all know how much our, our children do um, between school and sports and other activities. And, and for those families, it's another burden. It's another time commitment outside of the school day, outside of the sports. I understand that it's also a conflict with sports. Sometimes these students are trying to have their Latin class and they're, low, they're late for a, an athletic uh, practice and the coaches aren't, aren't being um, uh, you know, agreeable to this. So it's, it's ca causing a strain on those families. And um, you know, we talk about fees for the athletic events. You know, these are fees parents are having to pay to provide them with an education that they could get if they were living in another town. Um, that may be, I guess that's, that's pretty much the extent of, of my comments. I just really hope the board seriously considers this and you know, I understand there are budget constraints, but I think the same thing's gonna happen again next year and the year after that and I think we need to just bite the bullet, get it in there, get it up and running. Um, for the benefit of the students in, in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if it's appropriate for us to respond to the specific comments or not at this point, but um, does anyone else have any other comments relative okay. to either Latin and or Jeff's total proposal? Um. Well, I have two comments, I guess. One is, are we going to be on the air because these lights are driving me nuts for the rest of the night? We will be. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I can see you again. Um, Jeff, with respect to um, maybe eliminating some positions, it's not, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the Latin, does it? Or does it, just from a scheduling point of view? Jeff, you should probably come up to the podium so we can chat with you about this. No, it doesn't necessarily have to be the Latin. Right now, that would be my judgment. Uh, right. For the reasons I outlined earlier, I don't need to know if I need to go, go through them here. I'd be glad to, but it's getting late. But no, it doesn't need to be that. Um, and I welcome the board's input. Um, and but and but part of the related expense reductions are have to do with the the uh, uh, materials for Latin, though. Then, so if it were if it were not Latin, then those would all also go away. Then those expenses would come back in. You need the to board is aware of from the right. I mean, but what, <clears throat> one of my major issues is is, is again, it's not an issue for me of being against Latin. Or right. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. Um, because it's a good thing. Um, my major, I have a number of concerns, but my major concern <coughs> is by, by offering Latin um, one this year, we essentially commit ourselves to offering Latin two next year um, and not knowing what the budget 
thing, uh, um, climate is going to be next year this time, I'm just reluctant to sort of predetermine that when I know that there are other needs that the high school will have next year as well. I mean, I think the Latin materials is kind of minuscule. Well, I'm just, but it is related. Jeff, what are the other candidates besides Latin? Um, there's a number of things that can be done. Um, realistically, um, we have to have the science positions. We have to have the foreign language positions. Um, the foreign language, other than the French and Spanish expansion of those positions. Um, we have to have the additional math section, but that really doesn't have any budgetary implications because it's a transfer from the middle school. Um, in my view, um, given the fact the theater and the visual arts small additions that I'm proposing are consistent with the fact that there has been a long history of waiting lists for those programs. Um, and, the, and, and the additional bubble of students coming in or the additional population of students coming in makes that situation even worse if we don't um, expand those offerings, particularly where those are required areas that students must have something. Um, the one area that I, that I would frankly look at um, if, if, if the decision were, the advice were to really seriously look at Latin again would be the choral music program. Be what? Uh, would be what? The choral, choral music program. Choral. Um, or the other possibility is <clears throat> if the board wanted to say, you know, um, we want you to reconsider Latin um, as an addition to what I'm suggesting or um, say that um, we want you to consider Latin as a one-tenth edition um, and look at something else as a reduction of the tenth. Um, I mean, there are, that would again come back to the choral arts position. Um, uh, Jeff, the, the, the choral music addresses the elective issue. And what, from what I understand, we have a larger senior class right. next year, coupled with a large freshman class. So there's a right. need for electives and for those basic courses. If there, if there isn't the choral and we swap the one-tenth for, for a one-tenth choral with a one-tenth for a one-tenth Latin, where would those, what's your feeling of how that would all play out? Um, no matter what I do, there's going to be that same effect. Um, if, if Latin is, is, if Latin goes, if Latin isn't offered next year, then I have 58 students who need to find a, a home. Um, somewhere. Now, not all of them need to find a home, um, but most of them probably will want to at least. Um, there are some number of them for whom Latin would be the, get them up to the required 60 credits. Um, that's a minority, but it's a fairly large minority. Um, there's a number of other people who would, who, for whom this, this is the eighth class. <clears throat> they really shouldn't be doing it anyway. It's not advisable even to do it, but they're a fairly small number as well. But there are some in-between students for whom this is a seventh class. <clears throat> My guess is, even though it's not required, that, that most of those students would look for another place to, to, to get some additional credits, knowing that students at, at Cape Elizabeth um, that speaks well of them. The same really is true of the choral arts program. Now, um, why if, if, if there's a demand, there, there seems to be a demand for Latin. Yes. We need places for, and you're saying there doesn't seem to be the demand for choral music. In terms of the total numbers, the, the, the total numbers are not that different. There are 58 students who are signed up to take the... Uh, okay. 58 students signed up to take Latin. There are 52 or 53 students signed up to take the various choral music programs. Um, and so it's... But, well, that's... It's me, Jeff. So either way, there's going to be some people who are going to be, going to be looking for places. Can I clarify? You said yep. there were like 58 students who, who signed up for the various choral programs? There are 58 students who signed up to take Latin 1. That would translate into two classes. Right. So quite frankly, of the 58, if I offer two sections, and I can't foresee any possibility of offering more than, three, uh, more than two sections. Right. I'm not sure that all those students would be able to get it. In fact, we've talked about how we would decide who is able to take and who is prioritizing mm -hmm. among students, because otherwise we're talking about a class size of very high 20s, and that, that I don't think would work. Um, there are 50 students who have signed up to take what was listed in the program of studies for three choral music programs. Um, the expansion of the choral music program that I'm anticipating, I think the way it will play out is I'm anticipating a, a two-tenths expansion of the choral music program. 
Let me back up. There was there was a proposal at way very early on to offer um, essentially to convert to make a choral music program if the numbers justified it into a full time position. That would have involved adding one completely different choral choral program and one program which is called a singer's workshop, uh, which is sort of a pre choral program essentially, um, a more individualized, less performance based program. Um, the way, that, given the nature of the sign-ups right now, um, I don't think we can offer both of those even under the proposal that I'm making. Uh, I think probably two of the choral performance programs that are listed in the, or listed in the program will have to be consolidated. So that's not going to be happening. In other words, the position right now is a 50% is a, is a position. Um, uh, the 0 0.5 position under the proposal would increase to 0 0.7. What um, if you offered two sections of Latin? That's a point two position. Is that right? Point four. For two sections. Yeah. It's two fifths point? position. Yeah. Okay. So it's point four. And do we still have classroom space if you were to do that, or does that yeah. alter everything in here? That no. no. So. Essentially, then we'd be going from three positions to a 1.9 position. If you left, so it's an, it's an eight, eighteen thousand dollar issue. Well, if you add more it than, but I mean, I, I guess what I'm looking at is his overall. Right. Uh, and so. You'd be going from three to one. Like, what is, it'd be one. One point nine. Um, but the saving, you'd, you'd have to decrease your savings by $18,000. The, the other way that it could be done, just I mean, because it gets kind of complicated trying to think about it. The other way that it could be done is to increase from 1.5 to 1.7, offer the two Latin sections, and what I would then do is probably keep the choral position at half time. Well, I, I guess so cost, I go so back. In that case, it would cost half of the $9,000. It would cost $9,000. I guess I go back to you know, our job as a school board, which is to present a budget that we That's need to run the programs for our kids and not be, I mean, we have to be conscious of the budget, but I also think that we, we can't be ripping stuff out of here just to get a better bottom line. I, I, I have a real problem with that because I think it's gonna come back to haunt us. Um, you know, we're going to be paying, playing catch up for years down the road. Well, but, but Latin hasn't been part of the program, so we're not ripping it out. But we need to offer courses for these kids. So whether it's Latin or something else, um, where you've got, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not, I think we're starting to cut too much, is what I'm beginning to think. That we're going. I don't know, past what is what the kids need. And I think they don't have an advocate here. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, they do here, but I mean, in general. Um, but. And everybody's tired. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds to me like it's boiling down to multi-part decision. A, do we accept, uh, do we want to implement Jeff's proposal? And the part B is, do we want to implement it with Latin or something else? Or do you want to implement the, the dollar amount, whatever that dollar amount is, um, because what you're approving tonight would be dollar amount on the budget. Um, and then as we usually do, if you remember, the past history is those final decisions on what courses are never made during what, what I remember hearing was, you can't really tell until you figure out what kids are signing up for. So we're making some decisions about sign-ups prior to that time. Now, there's still no guarantee, but I think we need to allow flexibility as to what courses kids are going to go into, because we don't know that right now. Uh, there's, there's still some work to be done, but 
by whatever amount you decide on tonight you will limit how much flexibility the high school has because you're going to come up with a dollar amount and he has so many dollars to work with in, in, in staff and True. In so many positions so you will limit that but you won't necessarily limit the decision about well there seems to be a, a real need because kids you have this massive kids and want this choral program or theater or Latin that decision making process is something that happens a bit later I, I agree and, and um and I know that everyone is tired. I, the last thing that I want you to feel, Jeff, is punished by coming forward with a, a proposal. I think that um, you know we've we've had a chance to discuss it a bit, I'm, and and Jenna's clear about her feelings. I have the same sort of feelings, and I would almost move to a sort of a different proposal, and it's one that really just kind of gives you the authority to make some decisions. Um, we as board members are not going to make the the fine-tuning decisions about what makes an excellent high school program and recognizing that we do have budgetary constraints if we take this fifty four thousand dollars which would be the savings and we knock off the four thousand dollars I thought somebody said the materials for Latin was four thousand well I, I would basically say I would basically do this what in order to get nine thousand dollars which is a half of a or which is a quarter of a full-time equivalent if my math is correct because you had just mentioned, um, you had just mentioned 9,000 versus 18,000. My suggestion would be that we just bring this thing down to $45,000 and say through $45,000 of savings, and through whatever you feel is appropriate, to to implement these other changes in terms of eliminating the the portable, which would be good, convert the math lab, and I, I did want to hear what Gary had to say about that. Purchase the 20 station um, PC mobile lab. Um, don't eliminate the Latin materials, uh, eliminate the NEASC, um, hire the two ed techs or to the extent that there is some, there is some um, um, so, sort of some adjust, adjustment that would need to be done there if it was, you know, one and three quarters or whatever it would be. Um, uh, Schedule the common planning time, um, substitute savings, uh, and uh, pay the stipend, or whatever. Th that that in some ways gives you a little bit more flexibility to work with. Um, we don't. I don't think that the board should be making Latin or not Latin. I, I think Jenna has got a good point. We need to do something with this enroll this larger group of in, uh, kids who are being enrolled, and Latin is as good a choice as choral music, perhaps, or whatever. Who, who you know, again, um, you. It, not to make you the bad guy, but I think you're in the better position to kind of finagle this, figure it out. I, I didn't mean to sound. No, I didn't think it that way. Oh, okay. And and you know and make the make the determination from there. That way, we're not strapping you right to the last buck and saying you know do it. If you can save more than forty-five thousand, that would be terrific. But forty-five thousand seems to me to be a maybe a more reasonable number. It gives you more flexibility with you know, two tenths or one tenth or whatever, however that might work. I think that we certainly recognize um, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the proponent of, of keeping Latin there. There was a lot of energy behind that. The fact of the matter is it's also a new program and we're saying it's, we're not really sure we can do anything that's new. But there are still enrollment sort of costs, enrollment related costs. And like I said, if that ends up being Latin or choral or whatever, um, I think you and Mark and the staff are probably a better judge of how to do that and, and along with the superintendent than, than, than the board. And, and maybe if we just back off a bit, say this is a great and very creative proposal, we appreciate it. it's the kind of thinking that we need. We just when we thought we had tip, you know, looked under every single rock, um, you know, your creativity and the staff's creativity has come forward with a, a nice savings, $45,000, which is incidentally equivalent to probably what we would be getting if we were to institute partici participation fees or some, something thereabouts. So it's a, it's a good, it's a very good thing. I mean, that would be my proposal. I'm, I'm wondering if 45 is too much. I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't have done like that. I mean, I agree with you. I think that's the way to do it. But I'm all, that's, that only gives them 13 to play with. But I think, and I think we have to, I mean, I'd, I'd be the last one to want to, to say that we, um, 
that we need to to cut. But you know, there was a charge, and, and the charge was to see where we could find those monies. Um, we can do this, and with with George George's addition, I think what that does it gives a little bit more flexibility, and we stay we still stay within the class size guidelines of the district. You know, is, wow. that, is all of it too much? I mean, we could we could sit here and say let's take it all out, and yeah, that'd be nice, but then we would, I don't think we'd be we'd be adhering to what we're supposed to be doing. But what, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be coming up with a fiscally responsible budget. That meets the needs of the students, students and we're right. doing that. And, okay. This budget. That's what, uh, Jeff is, I mean, Jeff would not propose anything less than that, I don't, I don't believe. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I, I just have one caution. And, and the thing that I hear um, Jeff saying is that uh, next year he has needs as well. And next year, he will have needs for a guidance counselor, and there were several other things that um, he had mentioned. So I just caution us that to, and I agree with you, George, that it's Jeff's decision um, to do that. But but I think we need to look forward and not start something that we can't finish. You know, and and where does Latin one go to? If you know, and, and we did say no new programs this year. And we do, I believe, we do have an obligation to cut the budget. I feel that even with this $50,000 that will go through, we're still somewhere between a 7 and an 8% increase. Um, are we lower than that's that? That's the case. Oh, because Spot. I didn't take out the $150,000 right. from, um, from the state. The original, I don't know what this, this would do, but it brings us down to 5.28%. Okay. And it brings down the, the impact to um, 96 cents, of which 60 cents is strictly due to the decrease in state funding. So our budget is now down to 36 cents. Okay, so, so we're still over a 5% increase on this budget. And it does not um, impact class size. That's very no, important. No, it doesn't. It's 5.28, it, it, and again. I mean, again. it does not impact adjusting our parameters on class size obviously if there, there's going to be more kids in in some of the classes but and what we've just done by doing this is where I, I think it was approximately a hundred and something thousand of the budget aside from salaries benefits um, now it'll be close to 160 thousand our budget has been reduced from what we operated with last year so we're, we're operating the system with $160,000 less than we operated last year. Okay, I, I understand. Right. And so, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying that I think we do have to look forward, and we know that we have other projects coming up over the next few years, and I think the next few years are going to be tough. And I think whatever we can do this year in this budget, it needs to be done. I, I believe that we need to provide a fiscally responsible budget, but by the same token, we have to live within the constraints of our town. And, and we're responsible to the community as well as the students. Um, so, I, you know, I mean, I, I think this is great, Jeff, and, and I think, you know, this is very creative to um, come up with a way to have a mobile lab and computers and things that we really need, you know, and get rid of a portable classroom that we were going to spend $30,000 on. That but also but I has, just think we need to be cautious. It also has carryover costs for next year and right. cost implications for next year. So there's cost savings implications also for next year by making these moves this year, mm -hmm. as there might be for Latin, a commitment to Latin 2 if you start Latin 1. But there again, I'm seeing it more as uh, initially, I, this evening, I was seeing it as a new program. But really, I guess what I'm realizing is it's an, an enrollment-related cost that it can be Latin or it can be, you know, history of rock and roll or whatever, whatever it is. There are some things that are, that are needed in terms of those kinds of electives to fill, to fill the, the, the course, uh, not, or perhaps requirements, but the course listings. Um, or the course schedules for, for some of these students. So it's an enrollment. So if it weren't Latin, it'd be choral music or right, it'd be right, right. a section of something else. 
and what the, it's basically the high school's decision of what those you need so many slots and you decide what those slots are and i understand it's a new program but it goes by who signs up for what i guess mm -hmm. anyone else on this topic go ahead Sue. thank you um i think three comments one is i really think it's great that you were able to come up with this and I don't want to be second-guessing you here at all, Jeff. That's why th this solution sounds great um, to me. Uh, it, uh, have we done everything we can with the ATM? I mean, I'm very naive. I'm wondering if we can't use the ATM classroom as a study hall and have a camera be the, the you know. <laughs> so, I just want to, I know nothing about that, but if, you know, if, if you know, Berkeley, Offer some kind of ATM course in Latin for the high school level, if there's, if that's out there, or, or if it, ain't, we've looked at that. Obviously, I'm yeah. thinking. Okay. Latin is the one we've looked at very carefully. Okay. Some, some way to use it in classrooms, but that's perfect. We haven't found one, and I don't think it exists. Okay, and that would be kind of one I thought would, might be pretty easy to do. Um, and my only other concern is that I, I, I have a. a bias or maybe a, an opinion that this, that Latin benefits uh, maybe a certain group of the population that I think we already do a good job of meeting the needs of. And, and I know you're kind of the champion of the, another group of the population where we haven't been, I think, as good in the past historically and where I think we want to improve in the future. And I just, as you move forward with juggling, I also want to keep that in the back of our minds that I feel accountable to that population. And if we're going to be one of the best schools in the country, I'm going to hold us accountable to the measure of those kids and what they're getting for their parents' tax dollars. And I just, I'm thinking that maybe Latin is probably doing for what, what we're already doing a lot for this, you know, the same population. That's, do, am I, do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of muddled at this late hour. But anyway, as you go forward, just keeping that in the back of your mind that I think it, now or in the near future we're going to be accountable for those other kids um, to a higher standard. Pauline, do you have your laptop with you? <laughs> Better go get a calculator. <clears throat> Jim or Elaine? I'd just like to say, Jeff, that I appreciate the creativity as well that went into this proposal. Um, I, I apologize that I had to miss some of the discussion on it because uh, I had a, another issue. But uh, without hearing the, the discussion that went on in my absence, I, I'd be for the proposal as it was proposed originally tonight. And thank you. I, I do have to say that this whole process of discussing this this, this hasn't been just, I mean, the, I've worked really closely with the department chairs and that's what we've been doing, understanding and very supportive of what we're trying to do because they see the benefits as well. They see a cost because there isn't, we're within, well, we're within the school board guidelines, but they don't see any cost as well. But they get something out of it. Right. Uh, did, did, Gary, did you want to speak to the so, sort of the, um, the technology piece of this? I mean, I presume that there's been discussion, discussion and you're, I mean, clearly you're supportive of, of, it's, of this. It's actually part of the technology plan. We have labs in the other two buildings. We don't have a, an high school in this. It's kind of a creative way to get those. So, first. It's a great thing about this leadership team. We never have disjointedness, which is really great. I mean, but we, we need to just, we needed to ask that question. I assumed that, that you had conferred and were on board with this. Elaine, anyway? Yeah, I, um, I'm thrilled that, you know, we have a proposal like this in front of us um, because it, it does show that a lot of people worked hard on um, coming up with a way to, to meet, you know, the task that was assigned. And I too, I'm concerned a little bit about the Latin because of the community support that seems to be out there and, and the kids that we do have interested in it. And I would just prefer to see a figure where we would get two sections of Latin in there because I feel like this is the only 
time maybe three years from now when we have the, another but two years from now when we have another bubble go through that we might might be the next time we could address this and once again there is no guarantee that we would have the money at that time either so if we find some way to get those two sections and the materials in there and if the worst thing that happens is that we can't offer Latin to because next year we get hit horrifically again um, or if we, you know, instead of hiring two ed techs for study halls, we only hire one ed tech and we cut the amount of time that the teachers have for that free time. Um, that's something we can, that's a bridge we can cross at another time. Um, but in, in respecting the idea of what you want to do with the choral group, I'd like to see that happen because it's such, it's a two tenths of a position. Um, and, and, and try to get those two sections in. I, I, I'd still like to see that. My turn. No, no I guess not. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, I, I did want to, I know there is a concern about Latin too. Um, and the um, study that I did last year, I called three local high schools, Falmouth, Yarmouth, and Freeport, who are similar to size in Cape Elizabeth. And um, in all of those schools, there were two sections of Latin one. Um, in two of the schools for Latin two, it dropped down to one section. So it may not be as much of a financial burden um, um, for, for the school. Um, Freeport did still maintain uh, the two sections of, of Latin two. But you know, things did change a little from Latin one, one to Latin two. Um, so if that helps with, with some of the concerns. Um, and one of the high schools, uh, Yarmouth, did, at least this was over a year ago, um, did not offer Latin three or four. Um, Falmouth had one Latin three section and uh, one Latin four and five section. Um, Freeport had one Latin three section and one Latin four. So that's kind of how it's played out in these schools where Latin has been in, in the picture all along. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's my turn now. Jeff, I was one of those people asking you to be creative and you certainly rose to that little challenge. Not that I think it was very little in view of all the work you've done on this and I appreciate what you brought back to us. Earlier I said uh, we had two choices between accepting or rejecting your proposal, which is the easier of the two choices and then I said it was a choice between Latin and uh, something else and the reason I said that was because quite frankly I didn't want you to take the heat for rejecting Latin and I know I know you'll take the heat for that if that's what happens <coughs> um, you know but they pay us the big bucks to take that kind of heat on the other hand there's been more more than enough precedents in the past for us to say to the high school principal You've asked for point 0.1 or point 0.2 or whatever, and we're giving it to you, and we're not telling you how to use it. We're asking you to husband that money as best you can and to fill, the, uh, fill in the blanks as you, as you deem necessary. So I certainly, again, appreciate what you've done. I do not propose to tell you where to choose the courses that will go. I might be a little more excited about Latin if it was being offered at the middle school um, before students already had French 6 or Spanish 6 and it was actually meaningful in doing the things that uh, a dead language does. Uh, I, I took Latin when I was um, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you know. Um, so, but I also have always been a supporter of the arts in, in Cape Elizabeth at, at, at risk of not, you know, always doing my best to make sure they never get cut. So I would certainly feel good about accepting your proposal and leaving to you and the rest of the administrators the final choice as to a, a subject. And I, I, think it's, I think it's a reasonable thing to do because particularly because it keeps us within the parameters of our class size guidelines. 
If you were telling me that this went over our guidelines, then I'd be asking you about critical mass and everything else. But you're telling me it's within a guideline that we all accepted and voted on a while ago. Uh, so I think that that's an acceptable and reasonable proposal. And um, again, I, th I thank you and everyone at the high school who you had to uh, sit down and discuss this type of situation with. Now I think we have to uh, dispose of this question, and I'm not sure of a process, the, the appropriate process for that I, in view of the forum we're using. I, I think that we just need board consensus that we will adjust the budget again, and then, um, and then what we will bring forward is a motion to accept the, that budget, that budget number rather than the budget number that well, we're sitting we with right now. Well, we have one other question to uh, address before we can finalize that, that number for the budget. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think, can we get a consensus on Jeff's proposal as, uh, as made and leaving him the option of uh, subject matter? It's, it's really, it's really um, instituting a, a sort of a, a revision of this proposal that will result in no less than a $45,000 savings to be left to the, to, um, the principal of the high school to, to determine exactly how to do that given these same specific elements. Works for me. I like the proposal. <laughs> and we have the additional um, $8,000 savings. That's um, the other issue. Right. <coughs> I'd rather see 40 than 45. Whatever makes it a point .4, uh, whatever he can do with 1.9 teachers. Okay. Pauline, you, uh, can I just ask Pauline, um, if, if this were the proposal, what does that do to the bottom line? The proposal to reduce Jeff's savings mm -hmm. to 25000 Right. Um, that would bring, it would be a tax rate of 1696. Yes. And have you calculated in there a savings on the legal line that we looked at before. So you've already put in 8,000 in there. In there. Yes. And does that keep us under a dollar? Yes. It does. 98. 98. And well, we go on to the next topic. Would you come up with the calculation this 5.28% changes somewhat? Are we still sitting on 5,000? Yeah. That's well, you know what? Before we say, before I say that, I've only heard two of us, real three of us. But I think people need to hear the num the, yeah. the numbers for both. And so, what would the percentage increase be? Five point five point instead of five point two eight would be the increase on the expense side. If we change that by nine thousand dollars, what does that go to? Instead of five point two eight. Anyone else on this proposal as we're trying to get this consensus? Marie? Um, I'm fine with the proposal at $45,000. Okay. Jim? Yep. So? 45. Okay. I know uh, you'd like it to be a little bit less. Yeah, you're looking at. <laughs> you're looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's semantics, but I, it, yeah. clearly we we do have a consensus that we're we appreciate Jeff's work and would ask him to play with forty five thousand dollars, which we are going to carve in stone tonight for our own purposes. The last thing I think we have on the table is uh, yes and no on the um, cut to uh, the legal line. Uh, no, not the legal line. The uh, 
participation fee. Oh. I mean, we really, you know, Jim has reported back um, on what happened last night, but we have not formally said, yeah, let's go with it or let's not go with it. And I think we absolutely need to do that. I would propose that we that we hold participation fees in reserve. That we not include them in act, in our action tonight. Uh, if and when the council comes to us and says that we need to, to find more money, then maybe we'll have to revisit it at that point. But I would prefer not to have it appear in, in, in our action tonight. Thank you, Jim. But not to dismiss it. Just not to dismiss it. Maureen? I yes. agree. I agree. Jen? Yeah, I guess. Blaine? I'm comfortable with that. I like it, actually. That's the way I was thinking was I really don't want to put it in there. But come May 25th, if I have to, I certainly would revisit that before I would uh, look to shed blood. So uh, that's. I, I, I mean, I agree with not taking action on it tonight, but I, I don't support. I don't support it, and I won't support it, regardless. I don't want a message to the town council that we're we're holding it in reserve as reserve money because I don't I don't believe that it's there, and I, I don't want it to be there. I don't, I agree with Jim, I don't, I think that, you know, everything, you know, if we get, if we get advised that we need to cut more, then we sort of open the book again and, and we look at everything one more time. So we certainly won't, um, we certainly won't sort of banish it from consideration. I, I agree totally with George. I would agree with George too, but I'm already on record as having said a half a dozen times that given a choice between the teacher and the fee, that's what I, what I kill. However, just for the record, I am philosophically and strongly opposed to the participation fee. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea. So okay. Not action. I, I think we do really need action on the legal line because oh, yeah. it, was, it was thrown out there, and, yeah. and I think um, it is. It's good for us all to know that Pauline's already calculated it. So those numbers are very. Right. have already calculated a seven thousand is it seven eight thousand dollar reduction in the legal line which is you know live living dangerously but what the heck we still have some in there though. no and I and again that no. reduction is most of that will be we because of the expertise that we have on this board <laughs> um, that you can't leave till we leave as we get involved with negotiations um, we might be able to not need the legal help we've needed in the past. Does that mean we're doing from the <laughs> Yes. Joy. <laughs> have to be elected first. You're doing them again. <laughs> well, that ought to be tough. We might <laughs> draft you. Got a chance. Okay, Kevin. All right. I, think I, I guess on the legal thing, uh, do we have a consensus on that? To reduce the legal line by 8,000, I'm certainly in favor of doing it. There we go, Marie. Well, that's, I think that's pretty much the last line, which leaves us now with a proposed budget for the 2002-2003 school year of 15 million, correct me if I become wrong, Pauline, 15 million, 038, 234,000, which is a 5.30% increase which reflects a reduction of 445,714 in general purpose aid to education from our friends in Augusta, and would result in a tax increase, Pauline, of how much? 98 cents. 98 cents. Therefore, I would move that this board adopt the proposed budget of 15 million, 028, 030. 030, yes, I'm sorry. Looking at the wrong line, 15 million, 038, $234. Um, and we need a second on that. Susan? Second. Discussion or comments? Jim. Thanks. Um, as all of you, I think, in this room know, I'm, I'm going to maintain my opposition to the school budget. Um, 
While I recognize uh, my principal responsibility as a school board member is to ensure that we have the best schools possible, uh, I will not participate in what this budget does to the property taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth. I'm particularly concerned about those uh, property taxpayers who are living on modest and fixed means. They are people who can least afford property tax increases. I believe that a property tax increase of the magnitude demanded in this budget tends to make our town less affordable for more people. It's already driving lifelong residents from our town, and I choose not to be a part of that. I want to be very clear in making the next point. I believe that our staff and administrators have done a, an incredible job, an extremely good job, in trying to control costs in this budget. And I believe this speaks well to their uh, sensitivity to the, uh, to the fiscal challenges that we now face. And yet I still don't think it's enough. There are times when we simply can't afford to do the things that we would like to do. I think there are times we can't even afford to uh, maintain some of the things that we've become accustomed to. I think this budget recognizes that to some extent, but I still don't think it's enough. Budgets have two sides, revenues and expenses. I believe that were I to vote to accept this budget, implicit in that vote is that I accept both sides of the budget, revenues and expenses, and this I cannot and will not do because I will not quietly accept the revenue scenario that has been dealt to us, dictated to us by our state's Department of Education and by our state legislature. My argument, which I think has been consistent throughout this process, has nevertheless been called disjointed. My colleagues correctly point out that it is impractical for me to take issue with the revenue side of our budget. The state general purpose aid figures are now apparently final, and we as a body can't change them. And we do, after all, need to put forward some kind of budget. In practice, all of that is true. I speak to something even more basic than practicality, however. I'm making a very deliberate decision here to throw pragmatism out the window and to stand solely on principle. I will not quietly accept that in a state budget where overall general purpose aid to education increased by 3 percent, our district will receive $445,000 less in 2002-2003 than it received in this current school year. That's almost an 18 percent decline, reduction. That's the way things are, and, and that is wrong. $445,000 is the rough equivalent of 10 full-time teaching positions. $445,000 also represents the equivalent of about 6 63 and a, uh, and a half cents on the, on the mill rate for education in our local property tax bill. This loss is due both to the school funding formula and also to the fact that our legislators had only marginal success in restoring money to the originally projected $589,000 loss to GPA. It's not my intent to point fingers here, but rather to call attention to the fact that the inherent defects in the main school funding formula must be addressed now and not wait till just before next state budget vote. These flaws have been widely acknowledged in each of the three years that I've been a member of this school board, and I suspect probably for some time before that. Yet this year is by far the worst in the formula's treatment of our school district. We need to be sure that our legislative representatives in Augusta fully understand the seriousness of this and that it is committed to consistently doing what has to be done for Cape Elizabeth and its schools. We should also not be shy about letting our feelings be known to the governor, to Commissioner Albanese, and to legislative leadership over and over and over again until we are heard. It's not easy for me to vote against my school board colleagues on this budget. I usually take pride in being a, a team player on a very good team. But tonight, it's more important for me that I get this message out at the school board level. I don't think it hurts to hear it from a product of the Cape Elizabeth schools. I don't think it hurts to, to uh, hear it from somebody who's been a proven supporter of our schools. And I don't think it, hears, it hurts to hear it from somebody who has had an association with the Cape Elizabeth schools longer than anyone else at this table. I'm very grateful that I live in a place where I'm free to publicly voice what I believe will be the minority opinion in this particular setting. And uh, thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Jim. 
Any other comments? I, w I, I would make one myself at this point, and um, although I will go about it in a different way, I would like to associate myself with Jim's remarks. However, I will not vote against the budget. But what I have done repeatedly over the past few months is open my mouth and <clears throat> rely on my outspokenness to challenge everyone to address this issue. This is my fourth year doing this. I repeated that challenge last night. I repeat the challenge tonight. We must let Augusta know that Cape Elizabeth is as important as every other town and city in the state of Maine. I'm not asking for more. I never asked for more. I asked, don't take away more. And I continue to urge this town because one voice cannot do it. This town has to speak. If it has to speak through its checkbook and its campaign contributions, then that's the way it should be. And it does little good to speak with our senators and our representatives when ultimately the governor is the person who appoints the, the Department of Education personnel, and they're the ones who are making the proposals which hurt us year after year after year. Other than that, I support this budget. I thank the administration. I thank my peers on the board um, for being open and forthright throughout these conversations. We have not entirely agreed on every single issue, um, but I think we've managed to craft a budget that we certainly are not happy with, but meets the needs of the students, and quite frankly, that's my first priority. Other comments? Um, usually we do get a sense of endorsement from board members. I think Jim spoke and, and Kevin spoke. It's just an opportunity um, for other board members to, um, to, to have a word of endorsement in terms of the budget. If, again, don't need to, but we generally, well, we generally do. I guess I would share Jim's sentiments too about the lack of funding from Augusta, but um, we have no immediate control over that, and for that reason, um, I think we've worked hard on this budget, and I would support it. Okay. Thanks, Jen. I just want to thank both Kevin and Jim for using this opportunity to express a lot of our opinions, because I'm sure everyone here agrees with the philosophy behind how they're feeling, um, and um, I hope that someone's watching, someone's going to read um, a lot of what's been said and that someone else will join in uh, and take recommendations on some of the actions that they've suggested. Um, but tonight I'm going to uh, vote as a school board member to support the budget as presented. Thanks. Susan or Murray? Um, I, ditto. Exactly. I support it with the same um, the same issues that have been voiced. Um, I agree with, you know, a lot of Jim's comments. Um, well, I shouldn't say a lot of Jim's comments. I agree with, with what he's saying. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know, as I've said before, you know, what we can do to change this current situation and we're not the only ones in this situation I mean every day in the Boston Globe you can read about the Boston school systems and the lack of funds from the state in Massachusetts and it's going on everywhere in the country um, so I, we're not alone um, I know this has been, uh, this is my sixth budget process. I, I just want to speak to the process itself. Um, each year, I think we have done, um, we have made more than just um, incremental improvement to the process. 
um, we've, had, we've added sophistication. The administrative leadership, um, Dr. Fasella and the leadership team, um, have uh, risen to the occasion in terms of their sophistication, in terms of approaching uh, the building of a budget. Um, it, it, this is the hardest it's been. I think every year it gets harder. And um, I just want to be clear that the budget that we're passing, that I fully endorse at this point, um, it has been one that we have scraped at and poked at and prodded at, and it's one that I am not willing to look at um, being any less. We have identified our needs. Um, it's represented in this budget, and to do anything less than this is, going to, um, is, is not going to allow us to meet the needs of this uh, school system. Um, with that said, I'm going to take a vote. All those in favor? Six. Opposed? One. The, the motion carries. Um, the budget is approved by the board. Um, and I think we have one more piece to do, uh, which is uh, to look at the dates to remember, and then I'll ask for um, a meeting to adjourn to an exec executive session for this evening, um, and we will not be returning to public uh, session after that. School board workshop meeting, April 23rd, 2002, in the high school library at 7 p.m. The topic will be announced. Building committee meeting, Thursday, April 25th, 2002, 7 p.m., the William Jordan Conference Room. Policy subcommittee meeting, Wednesday, April 3rd. I think it must be May 3rd. Is it May 3rd? May 3rd. The first Wednesday, May 3rd. Whatever it is. Wednesday, May 3rd. May 1st, 2002, uh, 12 noon at the William Jordan Conference Room. On May 14th, there's the Finance Subcommittee meeting at 6.30 in the Jordan Conference Room, which precedes the regular school board meeting at 7.30 p.m. here in the chambers. And at this point in time, I do need a motion to consider um, the superintendent's request or a motion to entertain the superintendent's request to enter executive session to discuss negotiations along with the business manager um, with regard to the Administrators Association, the secretaries in EdTech 1 bargaining unit, and the EdTech 2 and EdTech 3, three bargaining units. Uh, do I have that motion? So moved. So moved by Kevin. Seconded. Jennifer, questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. Thank you very much. Um,